Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this hearing of the City Council Transportation Committee. Annie Dani Rodriguez, the chair of this committee. First, let me recognize that we've been joined by Council Member Diaz, Levine, and Kelo. Just last week, as everyone know, we saw a three years old child being hit by a pickup truck making a left turn at 116 and Broadway and First Avenue. You know, we send our prayer to the family. And of course, I know here in this room, we have a lot of parents and or some of you have grandchildren. And as someone that has a 12 years old and a six years old, and we cannot, you know, think on how that mother is dealing today with the loss of a loved one. So this is putting politics, governmental things aside, just thinking about that crashes continue happening in the city of New York. And you know, we know that it's not a lack of leadership, it's not a lack of effort, but this is, you know, the city that we inherit and the city that unfortunately we built around having cars at the center of a street. And we've been working so hard trying to change the culture through policy, strategies, initiative, legislation. And of course, the 116 and First Avenue crash remind me to the importance that we need, we must separate the time for drivers to turn and pedestrians to cross. You know, this, the way of how, it, and we know that there's a number of pilot projects already in place. And many of them serve us to look at data. I know at the local level that Broadway and Dykeman is never the same when a pedestrian cross from north to south at Dykeman when the pedestrian had a light only to them to cross and driver must stop. And then when the light is for the driver, the pedestrian know that they cannot cross. So that pilot project is working in many intersections. And I hope again that we as a city of New York, with the DOT as the agency that we assign that responsibility, continue making as many intersections as possible, as intersections where the light for, for drivers and pedestrians are completely separated. I also hope that we get a stay approval to reduce the speed limit when drivers make a turn. You know, we did great by working together and reduce to 25 miles per hour. But what is the speed limit for the driver to turn? It's the same as someone who drive in the middle of the block. So if we know that most crashes happen in intersections, then we need to be sure that we continue, again, doing the work and, and it's on the DOT team and leadership that we assign those responsibilities, but also we need to change some law at the state level that we get the city to reduce the speed limit when drivers make a turn. Today there's gonna to be a vigil at 6 p.m. at the intersection led by the family, the school in that area, and members of the community, and we invite elected officials, community leader, and New Yorkers to join those family as they you know, are dealing with the loss of the three years old. We cannot continue hearing about these strategies in a city that has been committed to ensure the safety of all pedestrians and cyclists. It is clear that we must do more to increase the protections for all pedestrians and cyclists. Since last year, we have seen almost 30 cyclists killed. That's three times the amount from 2018. Today, we will hear several pieces of legislation. The first is Council Member Rivera's bill intro 1812, which would establish an Office of Active 
transportation and an active transportation advisory board. In my legislation intro 1813, which will create an office of pedestrians. The two build together, seek to create the office for pedestrian and cyclists within the administration. We need to have an entity within the administration dedicated to pedestrians and cyclists concerned. These entities can gain a better insight into the issues facing cyclists and pedestrians and advocate for improvement to our city street. The office will work with policies, strategies, and initiatives around pedestrians and cyclists. We will also be hearing two bills by Council Member Lander, which seek to increase safety measures for utility workers. Proposed intro 946-A, which would prohibit on call scheduling for utility safety workers and require the advance notice of work schedules be provided to utility safety workers and intro number 947, which will require documentations of safety training for a street permit. We will also hear intro 1724 by council member Ben Kellos, which will create a program that would place cameras on school buses for the purpose of finding vehicles that pass school buses who red light are flashing. And of course, I would like to add, I hope that the, the same technology that will be used to uh, give those tickets to drivers that they don't stop when the school buses pull out the stop sign also is used to give tickets to drivers that pass the school buses over the speed limit. We must do more to keep all New Yorkers safe on the road, we must commit ourselves to be the most walkable pedestrians and cyclists friendly in the nation. Hoy vamos a mirar varios proyectos de leyes que buscan de que los trabajadores que trabajan con utilidades estén más seguros, crear una oficina de peatones y ciclistas, y también establecer de que en los autobuses que llevan los niños a las escuelas, los choferes que no se paren cuando está el stop sign, que también reciban tickets cuando no obedecen a eso. De esa forma, nosotros buscamos de que la ciudad sea una ciudad que sea más segura para los peatones, para los ciclistas y para los trabajadores. Uh, I now invite the sponsor of this bill to deliver the opening statement, Council Member Rivera. Rivera, no? Ay, Kalina. Yeah, Kalina. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I want to start uh, with thanking and recognizing Chair Rodriguez and my colleagues on the Transportation Committee for holding this hearing on very important bills, particularly 1812 and 1813. We are here because nearly 30 cyclists and over 100 pedestrians have died on our streets this year, numbers that are not only terrifying but unacceptable. It shouldn't take a rise in fatalities to spur change, yet it appears that is what finally initiated action with the mayor's office and their introduction of the Green Wave Plan. And it appears it is what pushed through negotiations with Speaker Johnson to approve the Safe Streets Master Plan. The bills we are hearing today to create so-called bike and pedestrian mayors are meant to prevent further delay by ensuring that political capital and authority is entrusted by the mayor and city officials tasked with the singular goal of making our streets safe in every borough. I want to give credit to Commissioner Polly Trottenberg and the entire team at Department of Transportation for their work, though, particularly in the creation of the very successful 14th Street Busway and their efforts to help with countless issues in my district. But DOT has to wear many hats in enforcing and planning for the future of many different issues on our city streets. And this, unfortunately, can often lead to cyclists and pedestrian concerns being relegated lower on the agency's list of priorities. And it also makes solving multi-agency issues more challenging. Now, with more New Yorkers using people power transit, and a streets master plan led by council member and speaker Corey Johnson creating a vision for the future, it's clear we need an office that can attend to this important citywide policy 
a goal that also coordinates between the numerous agencies that interact with these constituencies, very similar to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. We need an active transportation leader who can fight for the Brooklynite who lives in a transit desert, who can protect the Queen's delivery worker who is constantly having his e-bike impounded by the NYPD, and a leader who can advocate for a future that prioritizes safety for every New Yorker regardless of who they are and where they live. With the passage of these bills, we will be able to look to these office appointments and clearly know if future mayors believe people-powered vehicles, pedestrians, and environmental infrastructure are their priorities. And the Active Transportation Advisory Board established by my bill would also provide that accountability. I look forward to hearing from DOT and other city representatives about their thoughts on this legislation as well as ongoing and future plans to reach our Vision Zero goals. I am either on my bike or walking every single day, and I know how much of a difference these bills can make. And I encourage my colleagues to support them and the other bills we are hearing today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Councilman Rolander. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rodriguez, and I want to first give you uh, and Council Members Rivera and Kalos praise on today's uh, very good safety bills, and and just uh, affirm for members who are for the members of the public who are here on pedestrian safety that we are in very close uh, negotiations on the Reckless Driver Accountability Act and working very hard every day to bring that across the finish line, and we will not let up until we do. Um, but I am here today as the lead sponsor of uh, intros 946 and 947, uh, which aim to secure more safety for our underground utility safety workers. Utility safety workers perform an essential public safety task. Every time a street has to be open for a utility, uh, for a street adjustment, it needs to be marked from the top to make sure that those openings do not pose any danger, that damage does not take place, that the public is not exposed to risk. Um, unfortunately, two years ago, we had an oversight hearing and we heard from workers of USIC who performed that work about both very poor working conditions and real dangerous situations as a result of 24-hour on-call scheduling, low pay, and a failure on the part of their company to provide adequate training. Uh, coming out of that, they did some very uh, important organizing with Communications Workers of America and improved some of those issues as a result of their contract negotiations, so uh, props to the workers who did that organizing. But there are some issues that we believe need to be addressed by local law uh, to prohibit the on-call scheduling. If we did that for fast food workers and retail workers, surely we should do it for people who are keeping us our, you know, our, uh, safe and, and avoid damage from marking underground utilities and also making sure that those workers have adequate safety training before they open up our streets. So I look forward to hearing those bills, getting feedback from all stakeholders in the industry, and hopefully moving forward to secure safety protection for both the workers and the public. Thank you very much. Councilman McKillow. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. You can uh, catch me on social media, at Ben Kalos. Uh, looking to better protect children today, we seek to make New York City the largest school district in the nation to require stop arm cameras to be installed on school buses to catch motorists who endanger students by illegally passing school buses during drop off and pickup. Introduction 1724 of 2019 was a result of a series of high profile instances of drivers around the city caught on video going around stop school buses. It will require cameras on all of the city's nearly 10,000 school buses. According to the New York State Association of School Pupil Transportation, in a study cited by Governor's Traffic Safety Committee as part of Operation Safe Stop last year, an estimated 50,000 drivers throughout New York State illegally passed a stopped school bus every day. Additionally, a study by the National Safety Council showed that 70% of deaths related to school buses occur outside of the bus, and it's been found that more school-aged pedestrians have been killed during the hour before and after school than at any other time of the day. In a recent one-month, 26-school day pilot of the East Meadow School District in nearby Nassau County, 10 school buses captured 615 violations for an average of 2.3 violations per bus per day. Using that violation rate in modeling the New York City school bus fleet, that's roughly 10,000 buses, we can expect to see an estimated 23,000 violations per day, or 4.2 million violations per school year in the city. 
Every child must be safe as they get on and off the school bus. It could be anyone's child at risk from a driver speeding by and worse yet, drivers who have actually driven up on sidewalks. As a, a new parent, I can tell you that this literally keeps me up at night. We're all in a rush to get where we're going, but there is no excuse to put our children at risk. Stop arm cameras will catch dangerous drivers and actually issue tickets to keep our children safe. While it's already illegal in New York to pass a stop school bus, it currently requires that a police officer witness the violation to issue a ticket. But the state earlier this year enacted a law that allows localities and school districts to install cameras on school bus arms that capture the license plate of cars that pass stop buses. The photos are sent to law enforcement to determine whether a violation occur. Tickets are sent to the vehicle owner. Under the legislation, the NYPD's Parking Violation Bureau would enforce for fines for first-time offenders ranging from 250 to 275 and 300 for second and third offenders. Though the vehicle owners are fine, there are, no, there are no moving violations or points issued. In other states that allow such technology, repeat offenders are virtually non-existent. The bill also requires that some of the funds recouped from the fines be given to the New York City Department of Education. Once passed, the legislation will take effect immediately, requiring City to issue a request for proposal for vendors to install the cameras most efficiently and cost-effectively. I'd like to thank Transportation Committee Chair Adonis Rodriguez for agreeing to quickly hear this important bill, Education Chair Mark Traeger for co-sponsoring this legislation for his leadership on the issue. I also want to thank Central Staff for their hard work on this legislation, especially Jack Jacqueline Busalis, the bill drafter, and Jeff Baker for his attention on this issue. Finally, I'd like to thank my staff for their work on this issue, Jesse Towson, my Chief of Staff, Wilfredo Lopez, my Legislative Director, Josh Jamison, my Communications Director. All three spent many hours following the state legislature's progress and meeting with many advocates to ensure the best possible bill was drafted. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that also we've been joined by Councilmember Richard Torres Rivera, uh, Menchaca, Cook, and Ross. Uh, I would like now to welcome the representatives of the administration who are here with us today. Uh, and of course, thank you, the members of the Transportation Attendee and Family for Safe Street for give us the guidance that we need and the level of advocate on behalf of everyone who cares to make our, you know, our street safer for pedestrians and, and, and cyclists. I now ask the committee council to please administer the affirmation and then invite the administration to deliver the opening statement. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? and to respond honestly to council member questions. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Monty Dean, Chief of Staff to the Chief Operations Officer, and I am joined by Joshua Benson, Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Operations, and Sean Quinn, Assistant Commissioner for Street Improvement Projects and Head of our Bicycle and Pedestrian Units at the New York City Department of Transportation. We are happy to be here on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg and Mayor de Blasio to testify about some of the bills before the committee today. First, I will begin with intro 724 by Councilmember Kalos, permitting the use of school bus arm cameras under a new state law signed by the governor this past August, and we are joined by our colleagues from the Department of Education who are also available to answer questions. While this bill would simply provide the city with an additional option for enforcement, DOT recommends strongly against pursuing such a program at this time. Automated enforcement is key to Vision Zero. In order to save the most lives, including those of school-aged children, we follow what the data tells us about the causes of serious injuries and fatalities on our streets, whether we are identifying locations in need of safety enhancement or driver behaviors to target for enforcement. And fortunately, since at least 2014 when Vision Zero began, although passing a school bus with its stop arm engaged is illegal, there have been no deaths in New York City caused by this action, nor is it a significant cause of serious injuries. On the other hand, speeding is among the leading driver actions that kills and injures New Yorkers. Under authority granted by the new speed camera law that took effect in July, sponsored by Assemblymember Glick and State Senator Gunardis, and in a tremendous victory for a dedicated and inspiring group of street safety advocates, we are installing new cameras at a pace of approximately 40 per month. We plan to increase this to 60 per month in the year ahead in order to expand the number of school, school speed zones from 140 to 750. No other city in the country is doing a program of comparable scale and ours will be the largest in North America and one of the largest of its kind in the world. 
When the law went into effect, we immediately doubled the hours of operation and included summer weekdays and school vacation days. And because the new law permits cameras to be placed within a quarter mile radius of a school, rather than along a road abutting the entrance to a school, we can protect many more schools and target the locations most in need of cameras. We know this unprecedented expansion can be a key part of continuing to reduce serious traffic injuries and fatalities. The city's focus should remain on the driver behaviors most likely to kill and maim New Yorkers, including school-aged children, through the speed camera program, targeting locations around schools with the greatest amount of speeding and crash history. Now turning to intros 1812 by Councilmember Rivera and 1813 by Chair Rodriguez. These laws would require the mayor to designate an office of active transportation and an office of pedestrians and create an active transportation advisory board. These offices would be charged with developing plans for infrastructure, conducting outreach, serving as a point of contact, and working with other agencies to grow and improve cycling and other active transportation, among other duties. I will discuss DOT's extensive work in this regard. When it comes to cycling infrastructure, this year we completed a number of projects in the Manhattan core, such as Crosstown Lanes on 52nd and 55th, filling the 2nd Avenue gap at the Queensboro Bridge, new lanes on 10th Avenue, Amsterdam, 11th Avenue, 8th Avenue, and Columbus Circle, and Phase 1 of Central Park West. Our projects also included substantial progress on the 4th Avenue bike lane in Brooklyn from 1st to 64th Streets, Cypress Hill Street in Queens and Brooklyn, and Willis Avenue in the Bronx and we celebrated our 100th mile of protected bike lanes under the de Blasio administration on Fountain Avenue in East New York, where we've created a connection to the beautiful new Shirley Chisholm State Park. In addition, we installed offset crossings on 1st, 2nd, and 5th Avenues in Manhattan after resurfacing, which we will look to do wherever possible when restriping. And we met our 2019 goal of installing at least 20 miles of bike infrastructure in our bicycle priority districts, neighborhoods outside Manhattan with comparatively high numbers of cyclist fatalities and serious injuries, suggesting significant and growing bicycle ridership and few dedicated bicycle facilities. In our Green Wave plan for cycling in New York City, we have put forward a comprehensive vision for a citywide protected bike lane network, which represents years of work by DOT and collaboration with our city agency partners. The plan is based on ridership trends, safety needs, stakeholder outreach, mobility and cycling studies, as well as city bike and land use data. The plan seeks to cover the city with safe and comfortable bicycle infrastructure by 2030, a goal which is accelerated by the master plan law, transforming the cycling landscape to grow ridership and further advance Vision Zero. Our vision for the protected bike lane network provides an early indication for what a city connected with safe, protected bicycle routes will look like. Using the existing network as a base, we have identified key desire routes by looking at neighborhoods, employment, and commercial centers, recreation, and transit. With our plan, we seek to fill gaps and reach underserved neighborhoods while strengthening the network in the core and taking advantage of other citywide initiatives. Additionally, DOT examined ridership trends, community requests, and prior agency research, including cycling in the city and safer cycling to ensure a robust plan. Under our Green Wave plan, we have convened a bicycle working group similar to what is called for in the legislation. This group met for the first time on November 25th with representatives from Transportation Alternatives, Bike New York, Get Women Cycling, Bed-Stuy Restoration Project, and others. And we are planning to expand it to include even more people and organizations. The working group will collaborate on distribution of safety equipment, such as bike lights and helmets, review ridership and data-driven trends, discuss design issues, create evidence-based outreach strategies, and provide input on new projects, including those on our protected bike, bike lane network plan. Through these efforts, DOT will build and strengthen the community partnerships needed to support and develop a bicycle network that is responsive to diverse local needs. We encourage biking through our Get There campaign, including outdoor ads, social media, and public education events. Campaign visuals feature real New Yorkers enjoying bike lanes across the city. Materials focus on important cycling topics, and we distribute them along with equipment such as bells and lights. We reach over 40,000 cyclists a year through bicycle helmet fittings and giveaways at events all over the city. We cannot do this work without the continued support from council members who allocate expense funding for helmet events every year. It is truly a collaborative process we value. When it comes to outreach, DOT conducts workshops, designs curriculum, and produces materials to help businesses and commercial operators be compliant and safe. As you know, New York City's commercial cyclist law, initially enacted by the council in 2007 and amended in 2012, 2013, and 2017, helps to make commercial cycling safer and hold businesses more accountable. 
Through our Truckside View program, which we're expanding on our Green Wave plan, cyclists and pedestrians can learn about blind spots of large vehicles at events citywide. We provide safety tips as well as information on policies and programs to increase safety among city, contractor, and private industry fleets. DOT's Bike to School program encourages students, families, and educators to bicycle as a safe, healthy, and fun way to get to and from school. Through the program, DOT works with schools and community groups to designate safe bike to school routes, implement in-class curriculum, and recommend street safety improvements. There are 25 schools enrolled in our collaborative seventh grade bike safety program where all seventh graders in each school get on bike training each year. This program continues to grow and is supported by Bike New York and DOE, which has helped make this part of the physical education curriculum at these schools. Lastly, we work with Bike New York as well to support over 15 bike to school locations where students learn commuting skills, earn their own bicycles, and learn bike mechanic skills. Key parts of the Green Wave Plan involve collaboration with other agencies under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio. DOT is working closely with DDC, Parks, and EDC to build out Greenway connections using capital funds and continuing to expand and truly weave an interconnected protected bicycle net lane network into the fabric of our city streets involves more than just DOT. The operations of other agencies have a direct impact on the further development of bicycle infrastructure. DOT will continue to work with FDNY on emergency vehicle access considerations, with sanitation on street cleaning and snow plowing requirements, with DDC on street design and capital project management, and with NYPD on enforcement. As DOT expands the bicycle network, overcoming operational constraints will be key in the maintenance, enforcement, and design of bicycle infrastructure. Other local and state agencies play a role in providing safe bicycle and driver behavior on city streets. These include agencies that oversee fleet management, driver education, funding, and capital construction projects such as DCAS, BIC, Parks, EDC, TLC, New York State DMV, and the New York State DOT. Under the Green Wave Plan, the NYPD is maintaining continuous citywide implementation of its Operation Bicycle Safe Passage initiative, extending elevated enforcement of blocked bike lanes and hazardous driving violations, focusing enforcement on dangerous driving that puts cyclists at risk at the 100 most hazardous locations across the city as identified by DOT and NYPD, expanding enforcement of oversized and off-route trucks by specialized units and precinct officers, discontinuing the general practice of ticketing cyclists immediately following where a fatal crash has occurred, improving investigations of cyclists and pedestrian injuries by having a supervisor respond to collisions to see whether right-of-way law should be applied, as well as continuing to partner with DOT on education and outreach. We have long partnered with DOB on bike, the Bikes and Buildings Law, and in 2016 worked with the council, including Chair Rodriguez, to update that important legislation to fix loopholes, add folding bikes to the law, and expand it to ensure elevator access in residential buildings. Since the mid-90s, DOT has had a dedicated pedestrian unit. This unit, along with DOT's other project planning groups, work closely with elected officials and the community to develop and implement over 100 street improvement projects annually. The vast majority of these projects include pedestrian improvements and amenities such as shortened crossings, improved connectivity and visibility, vital open space, and traffic calming. The pedestrian unit focuses on projects that enhance mobility and accessibility, reduce pedestrian congestion, and prioritize pedestrians on key routes and thoroughfares citywide. And we are beginning the process of planning a significant expansion in pedestrian space as required by the master plan bill. DOT has eight planning units that develop street improvement projects, which work to enhance pedestrian safety. In addition to the singular focus of the pedestrian unit, three others have a strong focus on pedestrians. DOT's public space unit focuses on enhancing the public realm by repurposing public right-of-way for pedestrian and community uses, including plazas, street seats, street furniture amenities, and temporary street closures accompanied by programming. While all of the agency's work is guided by Vision Zero, DOT's research, implementation, and safety unit is dedicated to addressing intersections and corridors with the highest levels of all street users killed or seriously injured in crashes, particularly pedestrians. And DOT's school safety unit focuses on the safety of our youngest pedestrians, helping to make their journey to school safer by developing projects directly adjacent to schools and on routes typically taken by students. This year, we implemented numerous pedestrian elements such as sidewalk extensions and intersection upgrades at 7th and 8th Avenues in Manhattan and Nassau Street and Flatbush Avenue between Bergen and Carlton in Brooklyn. Five new pedestrian plazas, three new shared streets, and a complete redesign of Herald Square Plaza, which closed an additional block of Broadway as well as many seasonal street closures and weekend walks events. To, prom to promote walking, we focus on both the young and the old. 
working with at least 275 senior centers and other locations annually. And we work with over 100 schools each year with our We're Walking Here Walk to School Encouragement Program and provide pedestrian and bicycle safety education to more than 500 additional schools each year. And the city's active design guidelines and subsequent publications are the product of a collaborative, multidisciplinary effort among city agencies, New York's health, planning, design, and architecture communities, and academic institutions from across the country with the goal of producing guidelines related to active transportation and promoting health through design. DOT collaborated extensively on many of the publications in this series and continues to implement strategies defined within these documents in our current design work and educational programming. Our bike safety work is supported by a dedicated bike planning staff of 18, and our pedestrian unit has a dedicated staff of 14. Our public space unit has eight people dedicated to pedestrian and public realm improvements. And this work is supported by our policy, capital, intergovernmental, and borough commissioner's offices, safety education, school safety, and urban design and wayfinding. This year so far, DOT has responded to nearly 19,000 items of correspondence from cyclists, elected officials, community boards, stakeholders, and residents on the topic of cycling, and close to 6,000 on the topic of pedestrian issues. We are hard at work on ambitious plans to promote and enhance walking and cycling. This administration welcomes continued dialogue with the council and advocates about how city government can be further responsive to these street users, provide even more resources, and identify additional ways to prioritize the promotion of these modes across agencies. Finally, I will discuss intro 947, requiring applicants for DOT street opening permits to certify that all workers are in compliance with applicable safety trainings required by law. As background, DOT manages New York City's nearly 6,000 miles of streets to facilitate the movement of pedestrians, transit riders, cyclists, and motorists, and the delivery of goods and services throughout the city. Meanwhile, under the surface, the same streets support the city's water, sewer, power, and telecommunications infrastructure, as well as its subway tunnels and building vaults. Through the requirements in our permits, we facilitate access to subsurface infrastructure while maintaining street safety protecting New York's investment in our streets and minimizing transportation and community disruptions. DOT issues over 150 different types of sidewalk and roadway construction permits to utilities, contractors, government agencies, and property owners. From utilities and contractors installing, re replacing, and repairing underground infrastructure to developers replacing roadways and sidewalks adjacent to building sites to homeowners performing their own sidewalk repairs, we focus on requiring permittees to maintain the safe, smooth flow of pedestrians, including persons with disabilities, as well as cyclists and vehicular traffic at all times, and requiring them to properly restore roadways and street hardware. We issue over 700,000 permits a year, of which approximately 250,000 are for the street openings that would be covered by this bill. Only qualified entities registered with the department are eligible to pull these permits, and currently there are over 2,000 such permittees. In order to register, DOT requires permittees to provide proof of commercial general liability and workers' compensation insurance, a permit bond, copies of incorporation papers, licenses, and business certificates. With regard to the proposed legislation, DOT would not be in a position to know which trainings may apply in all cases, and we do not track the employees of our permittees or monitor turnover. For the work performed under our street opening permits, the range of OSHA standards that would be triggered could vary widely, and we and determining which trainings are mandatory would require a detailed scope of work and full risk analysis. And other requirements could be triggered if a permittee modified the way a particular task was to be performed. This type of information is far beyond the purview of our current permit stipulations or the information we are in a position to collect and analyze. On the other hand, if there is a particular training that the council is interested in requiring, it may be feasible to require permittees to submit it annually as part of the qualifications I mentioned earlier. To ensure the requirements of our permits are met, including temporary traffic control to protect both workers and street users, where appropriate, we conduct very robust permit enforcement. In fiscal year 19, our Highway Inspection and Quality Assurance Unit, or HICWA, conducted approximately 550,000 inspections, both in response to complaints and on a proactive basis, and issued over 50,000 violations. Not following the stipulations on a permit can result in a $1,200 fine and a requirement to, to take immediate corrective action, such as stopping work or reopening a closed lane. And working or storing materials without a permit can result in fines of $1,500 and $700 respectively. Unpermitted work is shut down immediately. Through our permit enforcement activities, we protect street safety and play an important role in the economic well-being and quality of life of our city. We are continually seeking to enhance our efforts and we welcome conversation and partnership with the council on this important topic. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify on all of these pieces of legislation, and we'll be happy to answer questions. I'm, are you ready? Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the committee. My name is Stephen Atanani, and I'm the Executive Director for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCWP Commissioner Laura Lay Salas regarding introduction 946 related to prohibiting on-call scheduling for utility safety workers and providing these workers advance notice of work schedules. DCWP's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. As part of this mission, DCWP houses the Office of Labor Policy and Standards, or OLPS, New York City's central resource for workers. DCWP's OLPS protects and promotes labor standards and policies that create fair workplaces to ensure all workers can realize their rights and enforces key workplace laws and rules like the paid safe and sick leave, fair work week, and freelance is in free laws. In 2016, Mayor de Blasio announced a plan to bring a fair work week to fast food and retail industries in the city. Extensive research by advocates and experts established that unpredictable, unreliable, and inflexible schedules in the fast food and retail industries lead to a host of negative impacts for both workers and businesses in those industries. Unpredictable schedules make it harder to budget, go to school part-time, and arrange for child and elder care. The Community Service Society, for example, found that 40% of low-income restaurant workers experienced significant fluctuation in their hours week to week, leading to serious hardships like falling behind on rent or mortgage payments, being unable to afford subway or bus fare, skipping meals because of a lack of money to buy food, and struggling to pay for prescription medication or utility bills. The passage of the Fair Work Week laws the following year made New York City the largest city in the country to end abusive scheduling practices in the fast food and retail industries and make pres predictable schedules a right, not a privilege for the first time. Since the Fair Work Week law's effective date, DCWP has opened more than 100 investigations into alleged noncompliance and has resolved several through settlement agreements with employers. DCWP's enforcement activities focus on ensuring that workers are made whole for violations and that employers have a proactive plan for coming into compliance. Part of a larger effort to promote a culture of compliance among businesses that protect workers and minimizes regulatory burdens. DCWP has been encouraged by the stories we have heard about the positive impact it has had on workers' lives. We have heard from workers who are now receiving premium pay for schedule changes and working clopenings, a term for shifts that begin on different days and are less than 11 hours apart. At least one employer stopped scheduling workers for clopenings altogether. One employee described the advance notice of schedules required by Fair Work Week as, quote, life-changing because it allows the worker to keep commitments outside of work. In at least two cases, DCWP reached positive resolutions of investigations with employers that provide for agency employees to train the business's managers and employees on rights and compliance. We are glad to see the positive impact that Fair Work Week is having on New Yorkers in the fast food and retail sectors, and we look forward to being able to share even more stories of success with you in the future. I will now turn to one of the bills before the committee today. Introduction 946 would ban the practice of on-call scheduling for utility safety workers, prohibit employers from canceling or adding work shifts on short notice, and require employers to provide advance notice of work schedules. The statutory scheme of Introduction 946 appears quite similar to that adopted in the retail industry context. DCWP would be responsible for enforcing the provisions of this bill, and we appreciate and share the Council's desire to explore this practice and impact of unpredictable scheduling in industries other than fast food and retail. At today's hearing, we look forward to learning more about the size, composition, and organization of the utility locating industry in New York City and the prevailing scheduling and on-call practices that may be used by employers in this industry. The Fair Work Week laws were built on deep, extensive, and research-backed understanding of both the fast food and retail industries and associated scheduling practices. Consequently, the Fair Work Week proposal 
was a targeted legislative response that was tailored to the needs and experiences of each industry's respective workers. The different needs and experiences resulted in different legislative solutions and statutory schemes tailored to the specific industry. At this time, DCWP does not have a comparable level of understanding of the utility locating industry, its workers, its labor organization, and its scheduling practices to assess the problem of unpredictable schedules in the utility locating industry, and whether the legislative solution adopted in the retail industry, for example, would alleviate or, more, or most effectively alleviate the problem in a seemingly unrelated industry. DCWP looks forward to hearing from utility locating industry workers, labor representatives, advocates, and employers. The law department is currently reviewing introduction 946 and considering how it might interact with existing laws and regulations that affect utility locators. We at DCWP are interested in learning more about the experiences of workers and companies, particularly those workers who perform ut utility locates in-house for public utilities or at smaller firms that respond to requests by private homeowners or small businesses. This type of input will help DCWP and the council form a more complete picture of the industry as we move through the legislative process. We commend the council for continuing to explore the negative impacts that unpredictable scheduling practices can have on New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I will now be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. I've been a little bit shocked on the DOT, you guys, a position on both. Uh, the argument for saying we don't support the legislation that the state already passed the law, that doesn't happen very often because most of the time there's a lot of law that we would like to do at the city, like making, empowering the DAs on hit and run. Sometimes we want to put more teeth to them, but we are so limited. We've been hijacked because the state doesn't allow us to do it. So here we have a law that passed at the state that allowed New York City to do it. And we are saying we don't have to install, it's not a good idea to support a legislation to install camera in the buses because the data saying that no one has been killed, that's unacceptable. We're talking about policy and vision for the future. We're talking about Vision Zero 2030. We have to prevent. So as a father of two daughters, when my daughter is picked up in Riverdale and taken to swimming in the yellow buses, drop her at York Avenue 91st, I want as many tools as possible that even though no crimes have happened close to the bus, but I know that as a driver that I am, and the 1.4 million New Yorkers who own cars in the city of New York, for them to know that there's a law that come the drivers are subject in order to get a ticket if they pass by. So when the data speak by itself, that nationwide driver keep going, and they stay allowed to do it, we come here to say, we don't think that that's a good policy because we're doing other initiatives and we've been working with a strategy and necessity and redesigning, that's unacceptable. The second thing is, I'm not a lawyer. If I would be a lawyer, you say a lot of good things about what DOT is doing and we've been partner on pedestrian and cyclists. But if I would be a lawyer, you're saying we don't need to create a cyclist and department department, a cyclist and pedestrian department because we're already doing the job. We have 25 months for this administration. We don't know who's coming after January 22. I'm a council member today. You're working with agency, but at the end of the day, we go through a recycle and we never know who we are. So I understand the culture as an agency, they don't want to be told what to do. Whoever is the top. But I can tell you that someone that represents Inwood, and I saw a lot of crashes at Diamond and Broadway, 
and I elected in 2009, and I met with a team from DOT at that time, led by another administration, and we sh went over the data, and we said we need to redesign Broadway and in Broadway in in Dagman, and all the thousand reasons was given why not. It took a new mayor, a new administration, a more friendly one to come and redesign Broadway and Dagman and reducing crashes. So all the good things is great. We've been partnered. But this mayor was elected with a mandate to close the gap between the rich and the poor Street block, print the data. Where do we have cycle, cycle, bicycle structure in the city of New York? In the middle class and upper class community. Not in the South Bronx, not in Washington Heights, not in the poor neighborhood, in Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. We're moving forward, we're working together, but city bike was not created serving the more underserved New Yorkers. It was created intended to serve New Yorkers who live few blocks away from where they work. Probably that's a group that need less bicycle. Because if it was intended thinking about the financial district, down 59th Street, there's enough train and buses in this area. Who deal with asthma in this city? Poor New Yorkers. We need to put a policy, a strategy, an initiative so that the streets are safer for pedestrians and cyclists. And I think those good things, yes, remind me to the time of Bloomberg administration and the staff coming to testify, saying a lot of good things. And all those reasons is great. You justify what we're doing. We've been partnered. But it doesn't reflect the vision of our city. DOT has to work with a $3 billion to reserve first our street. They have with pothole. There's so many issues in transportation. But if we are committed to make the city the best pedestrian and cycling friendly, we need to designate an area, someone responsible for a strategy and policy on how to accomplish that. So for me, that position means that you guys are against it, those two bills. You didn't say yes. No, you didn't say yes, you didn't say no. You didn't leave the space to come and say, we know that you are proposing this. Let's continue conversation around those two initiatives. And for me, that's no in the spirit of how we've been working together. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Rodriguez, we have, yeah, absolutely shared the same goals about making it a much better city for bike cyclists and for pedestrians. And uh, we certainly want to discuss with you the best way to do that. Um, and the right place to put, you know, these, uh, these resources. Your position on the bill is yes or no? Do you support a yes or no? We're open to discussing it, uh, what makes sense and what form it should take. Okay. And what about with the bus? With what is, what can you say about, you know, like, I'm not happy with that position about we don't have to do it because no one being killed. I think I don't want to, you know what, I, I need, we're going to be working together and we need to redesign 116 and First Avenue. When? After a three or so was killed. And I will work with Councilman Yala. And I want for the life to pedestrian and cycling to be separated. We don't need to wait for one child to be killed in order to say, let's work around installing the technology for drivers that they don't stop. How many drivers? Who have you been able to collect in the data doesn't make a stop when the stop sign are out of the yellow buses? Do you have those data? 
<clears throat> so we have, um, count, thank you for the questions, Chair. Um, we have uh, data for the last two years from NYPD. They <clears throat> issued uh, almost 2,300 violations for illegally passing stopped school buses with the stop arm deployed in 2019 and almost 2,300 violations in 2018 as well. Um, and I think when it comes to automated enforcement, what our uh, philosophy is, is we take street safety extremely seriously, as I think you know, and I think you share that um, approach, and we use a data-driven approach. So we've focused on our speed camera enforcement program, and we're expanding that right now uh, at a rate of 40 cameras per month, um, thanks to all of your support and support at the state level. Uh, starting in January, we're going to be adding 60 cameras per month. Um, and we know this, that speeding, um, the data shows us that speeding is one of the leading causes of fatalities and serious injuries. And that is why we focus on that behavior. Um, and and uh, I think we are uh, encouraged by the early results we're seeing with this expansion. But do you have any ideas on how many drivers don't stop? Do you collect, do we collect data? Not only about the enforcement, not only about the ticket, but it's about have you done some work to try to figure out how serious is the situation or driver that they pass by to the yellow buses even though the stop sign are, is out? We have not done counts of the number of people who are passing by, no. Council member. Thank you so much for your testimony today. I, I want to ask a couple of questions based on um, what is in your testimony. So you mentioned this is going to be a, a program of comparable scale and ours will be the largest in North America, one of the largest of its kind in the world in terms of speed cameras. But that was a mandate. That was a mandate by the state. That was something that the city worked really, really vigorously and urgently to implement, and, and I appreciate your vision, but why we're here today is because we're not going far enough in, in terms of street safety. So the bill's in front of you, and as I understand, asked by my council, my colleague, uh, Council Member Rodriguez, is you're not quite there yet on any bill, right? You haven't said you supported anything. You said you didn't support one bill, but from what I read in your testimony, you either are not fully committed to, to working with us, I guess, to, to pass bills that make sense, or you weren't prepared to discuss one of them. Uh, we're fully committed to discussing it and, and working out a solution. You ask, you say, you mentioned the bicycle working group, similar to what is called for in my bill. The first time they met is November 25th. How long will the group meet? Uh, this group will be meeting monthly starting in the new year. Um, for how long? Um, there's no end date. This was uh, something that we established as part of our Green Wave plan. Um, the first meeting was a smaller group for the kickoff. Um, we're looking to expand it. We're open to suggestions on who should be involved. Um, right now we have a core group of advocates and educators that we have involved, but it's open for uh, anyone to join. It's open for anyone to join. You have some incredible, uh, talented people on that uh, bicycle working group, from what I understand. But the reason why I ask is that even three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, the experiences for a cyclist and a pedestrian were very, very different. We have more congestion. We have more vehicles on the streets when it comes to whether they're for hire or, or just overall drivers. And, and I, I ask, what's the timeline? Because this, to me, has to be an ongoing um, conversation, the office has to be, I, I think, installed right away. I know that we have some work to do around the budget and getting some resources, but we really can't wait. And if we're going to be that, that progressive city that really prioritizes our environment, I think that this bill for cyclists and pedestrians and those on skateboards and scooters and e-bikes, it's a no-brainer. It also has a lot to do with our immigrant community that we feel are being targeted. And I hope that we can work on that. So you also said there are 25 schools enrolled in the DOE to teach people how to get on a bike. Which schools are they and how do they get chosen? I don't believe we have a list of the schools. We'll have to get that for you. Yeah, okay, if you can get me that information, I ask because when we talk about equity and resources in our New York City public schools, we find time and time again, the schools that don't have enough resources 
the money never gets there, the programming never gets there, the infrastructure and the vision never gets there. So if you can get back to me on that, um, that would be really important to me. Another thing that you mentioned is that other local and state agencies play a role in providing safe bicycle and driver behavior on city streets. How are you working with the drivers and the, and the bus operators? Because I feel they're so critical to this conversation. You know, we, we, I am not in this to shame drivers. I do think that we have to change the culture around how dependent we are on cars. But our bus drivers and, and drivers, how are we working with them to include them in this conversation? Uh, through our safety education division at DOT, we are constantly talking to drivers on the street. We're bringing our literature and education materials to those drivers, stopping them at stoplights, handing them flyers. Um, through our Vision Zero advertising campaigns, we're discussing street safety with targeted specifically at drivers. Um, through the Green Wave, we've also um, uh, convened a Vision Zero Truck Safety Task Force to work specifically on uh, trucks and how they interact with pedestrians and cyclists on the road, especially as um, the truck population increases in the city and the city's industrial areas become more residential. We want to make sure we're having those conversations with that uh, specific uh, community of drivers as well. And I, that's it's just so important because when it comes to our crashes and collisions and I think that your testimony is very straightforward in terms of what you're trying to do, the, the personal piece of it, the, the families that share their stories and family for safe streets. I mean, they have, they have started what is a, a movement in this city that I think people are watching from all over the world. So how do you work, how does DOT work with other agencies to encourage them to improve what they're doing around street safety, particularly around pedestrians and cyclists? So through uh, my division and various other divisions at DOT, we're constantly having conversations with various city agencies um, from DSNY to EDC, city planning, um, BIC, uh, just to have those conversations not only about educating um, how they can educate their constituents, but how they can include bicycle infrastructure in work that they're doing, how they can support our bike infrastructure, uh, be it smaller vehicles or um, uh, reviewing our bicycle projects like with FDNY, talking about better ways to educate and enforce with NYPD. We have consistent dialogues with all of these different agencies to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, and those are increasing as we outlined in the Green Wave Bill um, or the Green Wave uh, plan, we're having those conversations more frequently. They're gonna be more important, especially as we're trying to do more um, in the years to come. I agree, I think it's, it's DOP, DOB, DEP, it's Con Ed, and I, I hope, I, I, I'm tempted to ask whether you honestly think that all these agencies are doing well interacting with each other, but I know that you have a, a goal, and, and I want to work with you on that. And then my last question, because I, I know that a lot of my colleagues have questions, is that you have identified 100 most hazardous locations across the city, and I thank you for that in terms of making improvements. I ask two things, that you really try to also look at neighborhoods that are very dense in terms of cyclist use. I mean, I'm going to just talk about my district for one second. and. We're like number one on seamless. I guess no one cooks in the East Village. But that, just that constant activity is just, I think, something that we have to look at. It might sound a little luxurious, but it's, it's a factor in terms of, of how people are moving. And then the other thing that I, I would just ask is, is that um, we really try to look at this office as an opportunity to become, I think, a national leader. I certainly want to work with you on that. The, the bike mayor is to encourage this interagency communication, and um, I'm excited for it. And I just, just want to thank you for all your work thus far. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, and we're uh, jumping around between the, the bills a little bit, so I'll just uh, kind of apologize for the cognitive dissonance. And obviously, I'm just such an extraordinary fan of the efforts for more street safety. So uh, the fact that I'm focusing on 946 and 947 is just those are the bills that I have on uh, for today. 
uh, and I appreciate the other members who are going to be focusing, especially on the pedestrian safety bills. Um, all right, so uh, Mr. Dean and Mr. Edanani, <clears throat> thank you for your testimony on 946 and 947, the bills to strengthen safety and protections for utility safety workers. As I heard you both, you are interested in listening from some of the workers and understanding the situation on the ground. That's just why we're having this hearing, so I'm glad so many of them are here when we get to testimony, which is why I'll try to keep my questions short. That's really our goal. Um, I agree, Mr. Edanani, this is a different situation from fast food workers. Fast food workers were uh, facing this like constant erratic, erratic changing of schedules. Um, as I understand it in the utility uh, safety and underground damage prevention uh, industry, what's more common practice is requiring people essentially to be on call for 24-hour periods on the idea that it's sort of emergency work, but when in fact it is overwhelmingly routine and schedulable work. Um, and in fact, what happened was in a lot of cases, these were jobs that had been in the utilities previously, unionized, scheduled, good jobs that um, uh, companies, USIC and others, realized they could kind of pull out and make lower wage and then kind of use the idea of uh, some kind of on-demand scheduling to just make them able to um, achieve their financial goals at the cost of workers. So we're going to hear about that from workers later, um, but I think you'll come to see that uh, providing them a certain kind of reasonable schedule, stable fair work, we can advance notice while a little different from fast food workers will help us achieve uh, a, a useful justice aim, and I appreciate your willingness to listen to them when they when they come later. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Council Member. And I think just to reiterate um, what our position is, is that we, as just a general tenant, we believe that workers should have predictable scheduling. I think, um, as I mentioned in testimony, whether it's um, you know uh, just having a sense of certainty, certainty about how much you know money you're going to get on a week-to-week -week basis to um, you know other outside of work commitments, whether it's elder or, or uh, child care, for example, these are critical things and things that the Office of Labor Poli Policy and Standards within DCWP supports. Wonderful. I thank you for that clear statement, and I look forward to hearing the testimony from workers and providing you with additional information to think about how that goal we share of predictable scheduling can be most effectively implemented for this uh, set of workers. And uh, you know, obviously, I guess one thing I'll just say is this isn't just that we were kind of thinking what other industries these folks brought us a problem that we think fair scheduling is a solution to, and that's why we're here having this hearing today. Um, and then just a couple of quick questions on the safety training uh, side. So I, I think if I understood the testimony, but I just want to make sure I'm right, there is not currently an, you know, um, any safety training required for the workers who you know, mark or open our streets. It sounds like there are things that the companies have to submit on an annual basis, there are commercial general liability, but that there is not currently um, safety training requirement for utility marking or excavating work. Correct. There's nothing they submit right now as far as whatever trainings they do. Okay. Um, and does DOT or any other city agency partner with the, I guess there's this 811 office at the state level, excavator training and education programs. Do you know if there's any partnership there? Uh, we, if we're doing work, we'll, you know, we'll call the 811 if we're doing digging to make sure that we're not you know, going to hit anything that's underneath there. But that's not with their training and education program, just with the, Correct, the conflict service. avoidance, which is good. I mean, I'm glad you're doing that. But, um, okay, so, um, and I know that at the state level, there's some new legislation requiring excavators to do some safety and education. Do you know whether the city has yet engaged with, with that legislation or its requirements? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, um, all right, so... It sounds like there's here also some fact-finding for us to do. I think most New Yorkers would think it was common sense that the workers who have this very important job of getting the markings right so that no damage is done would need to have the training that would enable them to do that safely and soundly. Um, and I hear you that that does not mean that DOT should be making sure every single worker, you know, is review, you know, you're not reviewing the portfolios of each individual worker. Um, but it sounds like you're open to finding some way that the obligations of the companies that are doing it to provide adequate training, if we can figure out kind of what the markers of that are, 
um, that they could be required to submit the evidence of their compliance with those safety regimes as part of their annual package, and then you could, as part of your ongoing enforcement effort of making sure that people are complying with the rules that they are following when they picked up their permits, uh, you would structurally be able to both um, require that, you know, the law, if it required that certification, you could see it in their annual certifications and enforce it through your regular enforcement work. Right, I think we would, if we knew specifically what training we were talking about, then we could ask them to provide that documentation and um, it would be a requirement of them being a permittee in that sense. And that could be enforced with the other requirements of being a right. permittee. Right, right. Um, okay, all right, uh, that's great. I think then this was another good opportunity for us to hear and understand what the skills needed on the job are, what the tra basic training that people have are, and then to follow up to make sure we can provide it in a real clear way so we know what it is we're requiring that workers have, how companies are responsible for showing it to the city, and how we're following up to make sure that those, that those laws are being followed. So uh, we're looking forward to the testimony. Thank you both for your uh, openness to working with us to achieve these improvements in this sector, both for the workers and for the public. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kello. Uh, the opposition to the automated enforcement for the staff arm really caught me by surprise. Uh, do you believe it is safer when vehicles are stopped when children are getting on and off a school bus? Council member, absolutely. We, uh, you know, uh, want all motorists following all the rules of the road at all times, um, and and we believe it it is safe when when motorists do so. Um, and I, you know, I think um, you you have some some data that that you uh, mentioned earlier that we haven't had a chance to review yet on on um, this program elsewhere. We have some data that I cited earlier. Uh, perhaps it makes sense to. To, to get together and, and review um, what we have and, and you know, s compare notes, as it were. I, I, I really, really appreciate that. I think one of the questions is in response to Chair Rodriguez, you mentioned that 2,300 violations had been issued, I guess just as a values question, to the extent that our brothers and sisters uh, in the PBA and the NYPD aren't as concerned about writing these violations, isn't there an opportunity for us to get those 2,300 police so 23, the people who wrote those violations are writing violations that can't be written by a robot uh, versus using automated enforcement wherever we can. Uh, council member, you know, we, we absolutely believe in uh, the power of automated enforcement and, and for that reason, I think you brought up a great point, which is when we can free um, the, the, office, the highly trained officers to do, do very um, targeted work, um, that's a great side benefit of it. I, I appreciate our partnership. Um, when you testified, I pulled the uh, open data set for the uh, NYPD, which was the motor vehicle collisions. And uh, it looks like they haven't really been tracking school buses as a data point. But um, e even so, over the past two years, they, there have been a lot of collisions. and. Most frequently, it looks like it's the motorists, anyone in the vehicle that's been injured. Uh, do you, is there a data set that tracks just when, when pedestrians are the ones? That, I, I guess based on the data set, which I've done a lot of work with, it has one, one column that tracks vehicle number one, another column that tracks vehicle number two, but based on the way a police report tends to be written and based on this data set, it doesn't appear that we, we have an adequate way of tracking when somebody gets off of a school bus and then ends up in it based on just my an preliminary analysis of the data sets. Council member, I think um, that you're accurate in that there's no quick, easy way to, to okay. screen that data, but what we've been doing is going back through every report that had a school bus vehicle involved and reviewing the narrative of those reports, um, and it's very manual, but that's how we're, we're looking through these. So we've looked through the last two years of, of data and we didn't find any serious injuries. And that you were looked through those two and you found 51 collisions? I don't know the number of collisions off the top of my okay. head, I'm sorry. Uh, in, in 2018, I did an op-ed in City Limits just saying that the city should have more than 140 speed cameras. My, my proposal is that 
uh, in addition to focusing on the schools, to just look at any location where there have been a certain number of collisions or a certain number of injuries or a certain number of deaths. And I'm, I'm eager to get a response from DOT and to work around places beyond schools that we can make safer and then also just making sure that kids can be safe getting on and off the bus. I thank you. I look forward to working with you and your agency on this legislation and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And I think to your point about, you know, getting a wider reach with the um, speed cameras, like thanks to all of your support and um, the state legislators supporting, uh, we have a wider radius now around each school. And I think um, we're, we're covering a lot more pedestrians with our, uh, when our, with our speed cameras than we were, um, you know, before July. So thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dorey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm supportive of all the bills, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on intros 946 and 947. I want to follow up on some of the questioning for DOT. Uh, it, it, on the questioning of, from Councilmember Lander, it, it, it seems to me, you know, we have a vested interest here as a city because we control the streets. We own the streets. We issue permits over those streets. And we should leverage the power that we have over permits to mandate higher safety standards, higher labor standards. Is that something that you agree with in principle, setting aside the details of the legislation? Do you agree with that proposition in general? Well, I think, you know, as we mentioned, if we know exactly what we're looking for in terms of what the training should be, uh, then yes, it's something we can certainly try to do and figure out a system that works for that. And, and does DCWP support extending prevailing wage to utility employees? We're not in a position to, to talk about that right now. We're talking about 946. Okay. Does anyone have a position in 947? Or? For me, it's a no-brainer. Like, th these are workers who are protecting us from explosions, who are protecting us from the loss of critical services, who are protecting the critical infrastructure that enables our city to succeed and survive every day. So if those workers are not worthy of prevailing wage, then which workers would be? So for us at, at uh, DCWP, we're, you know, and again, we're, we're, I'm here and prepared to testify on, on 946. We want, and our office was created, obviously, by the council to empower workers and make sure that their rights are, are heard. Um, in terms of the bill itself and predictable scheduling, that's that's something but that we're- Part of worker empowerment is not only predictable hours, but decent wages, prevailing wages, safety training. All of those are essential elements. I mean, I think you, I suspect you would agree, worker safety and public safety are inextricably bound together. Right? You cannot have one without the other. And it's in the interest of public safety to see to it that these utility technicians are paid a decent wage. Yeah, I think, you know, um, from our testimony, it's clear um, that we want to learn more about this industry. We want to hear from the workers directly. We want to hear from the stakeholders, um, the employers, knowing a little bit more about the structure and get a clearer sense of, of kind of the ecosystem there and then, um, work with the council to um, either refine, refine the bill or, uh, or uh, you know, just have further discussions with the council on, on their rights and, and uh, yeah. certainly um, uh, their workplace safety and things of that nature. I, I remember, and I don't know the status, but I, I remember reading a few years ago that um, Partners Group was partnering with uh, an organization known as Ottawa Avenue Private Capital to potentially acquire USIC, which is the contractor that, that hires utility employees, and that Ottawa Avenue Private Capital was owned by the RVD Corporation, which in turn is owned by the DeVos family, Betsy DeVos from the Trump administration. Uh, you know, Donald Trump is the most anti-union president in American history, so the notion that US, S, USIC is owned or could be owned by an associate of the Trump administration is horrifying to me. Um, and so that to me 
is further reason to ensure that contractors like USIC come under greater scrutiny from both DOT and DCWP. I think the city needs to play a role. You know, these are workers who risk their lives to keep all of us safe. The least we can do is pass laws that ensure that they have a livelihood that reflects their public value and that reflects the danger of the work that they do. Um, but that, that's my position and I hope the administration comes around to embracing both predictable hours, prevailing wage, and proper safety training. So with that said, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair, and thank you for, for being here. I will, uh, I'll just continue with the line of questioning from uh, my colleague from the Bronx, Councilmember Torres, and really ask at the, uh, for consumer affairs and the work that you're doing there. What do you understand the issue to be right now? I know that you're asking for more time to really understand. What can you tell us a little bit about the investigations that you're doing? I know that some of your testimony kind of pointed to some of that, but if there's something more that you can tell us in terms of what you understand and how you understand it now. Right, so I think if you wanted to just take a, a step back about um, Fair Work Week and the value of predictable scheduling, I think since 2017, there's no doubt that um, the laws that the, the council passed um, are successfully um, uh, holding employers accountable um, if they are um, in violation of the law. I think to date, we've actually secured over a million dollars in restitution for workers. Um, and. I think we're talking about roughly 3,000 workers as well, uh, based on those numbers. In terms of our investigations, um, we w are not in a position to speak to the specifics of current investigations um, happening right now. Um, as I mentioned um, in my answer to uh, Council Member Torres, for us, predictable scheduling is um, uh, a, a value that we embrace. It's something that um, we believe all workers should have um, for, for a number of reasons. And for, for us right now, we're trying to get more information about this industry um, so that we can um, effectively weigh in one way or another as to what the mechanics of potential legislation could or should look like um, as we have these discussions with the council. Well, tell me a little bit more about what, what you understand. I guess I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about what you understand now. I get that you're in discovery mode, but is there anything that you can share with us? I think we're all very interested in, in not just the legislative process, but uh, a kind of transparent understanding for public and especially workers who are here right now trying to understand w what's up and why are we feeling a, a kind of um, hesitation. And so that can be, I think, mitigated by just a little bit more information, stepping back, general, about what you know and how you know what you know right now. Yeah, I think just, um, you know, a couple of questions that come to mind uh, currently uh, include, for example, if there's, uh, uh, is it best to solve this issue through, for example, like premium pay? Um, should it be a, should we have a prohibition on last minute scheduling in general in this industry? Um, how prevalent it is and, you know, even to take a step um, back beyond that, um, do workers have regularly weekly schedules in this, in, in this industry? I mean, we are, um, when I say uh, we are in a fact finding position, we are, uh, you know, it's a clean slate on our end. We are trying to find out as much as possible about this industry. Awesome, I appreciate that. And I think that those are the kind of things that I think would be helpful as we continue. And I'll, I'll just pause there and just thank you for that. And let's just keep, I think, discussing this uh, as, we, as we explore that together. For sure. And uh, on the DOT side, the, the work that went into building the uh, uh, Rivera, uh, Rivera's bill in terms of the offices and Rodriguez's bill uh, for the different kind of pedestrian and, and the bike of offices. Tell us a little bit about what the um, the work is to build build more constituent base conversations, allowing allowing communities to kind of build build out solutions, policy solutions at the at the local level. Um, things like and themes like not every bike lane is created equal. 
um, uh, communities, communities on the ground, uh, some neighborhoods, I'm thinking about like 4th Avenue and how 4th La Avenue bike lane, there's like two different approaches to the bike lane that came from Park Slope versus Sunset Park, very different, but ultimately a bike lane emerged. And, and so these are, these are th this, this is, this is the, the kind of granular um, understanding of neighborhood-based planning. And how does that impact your understanding of what we're trying to do, which is really focus conversations around pedestrians as a constituency and bicyclists? Yeah, so as you, uh, thank you for your question, Council Member. Uh, um, as you and your other fellow council members know, we are out in the community talking to people. Um, we go to community board meetings. We uh, work with advocacy groups and other constituents, constituencies around the city. Um, one thing that we've done recently as part of the Green Wave plan is we've um, hired or we're hiring one person per borough office to focus specifically on bike uh, issues. Um, those folks will help us not only as we uh, expand the amount of work that we're doing to um, bring that information to the communities, but also to help us talk to um, local communities about issues around uh, cycling and pedestrian safety. Um, we've developed a lot of tools online as well. Um, portals to make sure that people have a way to give us input to on projects if they're not attending meetings and of course we have our great street ambassador team that's out on the street um, out on the streets talking to people people who can't usually go to community board meetings or who are left out of the conversation trying to bring them into um, that conversation so we've developed several different tools both internally um, you know in our offices but also on the street um, and online Okay, well, um, we're gonna keep talking, and I know we talk a lot about immigrants and language access to these questions, and I feel like we're, we're not there yet at all. I think that's, that's like a big, we leave a lot of people behind in, in communities like mine in my district where, uh, you know, 75% are non-English speaking families, and those, that you just leave behind when, and I'm not saying you're only doing English based, you're not, you're, you're, but there are gaps, and so when there's gaps, um, it just kind of leaves us with more opportunity to connect. I'm just gonna point one thing to one thing and then I'm done with my questions. They kind of just leave a sense of gap is the, the you do a lot of education programs around helmets and get, getting free helmets out to communities. And really the, 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 the partnership is with council members that put funding. And so really, what, as I understand it, this is about members putting in their allocations for free helmets. For, to buy helmets for, for community members. So if there are co council members that just don't believe in this, then there's an issue, there's a gap. And this is just an example of how I think this is kind of broken, and this is why we need to have focus. Instead of, instead of communities that need and have good representation that are like pro, <laughs> pro bike, pro safety, there might be council members that just don't wanna put any money or put any focus on it, and now we're relying on that, and I think that's, that's a problem. I think this is why we're trying to call to attention a sense of focus around this. It doesn't, it doesn't rely on, on one, one gap of understanding that's gonna really impact safety programs like free helmets. Yeah, that's a very good point. And um, that was a hole that we noticed in the helmet program. We really um, are thankful to the council members for providing that funding. Um, as part of Green Wave, we did secure a separate pot of funds <coughs> so that specifically for helmet giveaways, so that we can ha hold larger events in districts that aren't being represented by uh, council members who are favorable to that <coughs> work. So um, with that pot of money, we'll be developing a plan for where those uh, events will be held and we'll try to uh, hit a larger audience. Great, thank you. Council Member Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Chair. Buenas tardes, everyone. Um, so this uh, question is for the Department of Transportation. Uh, I just want to discuss a little bit about the Green, uh, the green Wave uh, plan. Uh, you did mention that key parts of the Green Wave plan involve collaboration with other agencies uh, under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio. And you also continue that DOT will continue to work with the FDNY on emergency vehicle access consideration. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Thank you for your question. We, um, DOT meets regularly with the FDNY and we present um, all of our street improvement projects to uh, the agency. We work through a central uh, planning division at FDNY um, and that planning division brings the information uh, to local firehouses and battalions for their feedback. Um, oftentimes we are able to incorporate feedback into our plans, modifying um, our, our proposals to ensure that it works for FDNY. Uh, we also ensure that when we bring our plans to FDNY that they've been reviewed by our internal engineers to show that um, operations won't be impacted. Um, that system is currently um, being modified through some of the Green Wave actions to ensure that there's more input from uh, local houses versus just the centralized division of planning. Um, and we're working through that uh, process now, but we hope to get a larger set of feedback through that. So what happens to a project that you worked on for several years and maybe even se um, several months and only to find out that the FDNY um, opposes your plan? Uh, so that has happened on a couple of occasions and we've worked with FDNY to hopefully get to a point of um, common ground on a proposal, um, making modifications to the, the plan, um, talking them through things that um, they might understand about the proposal and vice versa. Um, so it's an ongoing dialogue when we hear um, both positive and negative feedback on a proposal. So how many uh, miles of bike lanes uh, have DOT, has DOT implemented and um, does all those plans have the stamp of approval uh, from the FDNY and if it does um, or doesn't, um, is there, uh, how soon could the council get those plans to see if there, there is a stamp of approval or not? from the local firehouse or from uh, central planning division? So um, since, oh, uh, we have over 1,300 miles of bike lanes on um, the city streets or within New York City. Um, 140 of those are on street protected bike lanes. Those are the lanes that we uh, focus our conversations with FDNY. Um, we keep records of the sign-offs and conversations between us and the agency. So how many from these uh, 1,300 miles of bike lane and 140 miles of protected bike lane does not have a sign-off from the FDNY? I can't speak historically, um, however in the past... Does, is it possible that you do not have a sign-off on any of these miles, hundreds of miles of bike lanes from the FDNY? I don't... Is it possible? Answer to that question. Um, I'm sorry. There, there may be projects that we haven't uh, reviewed with them in the past historically. Um, however, we haven't we have an outlet um, through our borough offices and through our conversations with the planning office that if there was something we put in place a long time ago, that we are open to have conversations about changing or modifying plans. So I just want to touch upon um, intro 1812. Um, so in the plan, you, you, uh, it's, it talks about uh, work with other city agencies to grow and improve cycling and other methods of ac active transportation by coordinating infrastructure and policy initiatives. And I, I don't see that you do support um, the intent of this bill, but if you did implement uh, hundreds of uh, miles of bike lanes, and without having the approval from the FDNY, and this is what happened in the past, this is what you uh, implemented in the past, um, I think that having um, more of a, a dialogue and having more of a conversation and, and giving people that opportunity uh, to be part of the policies and procedures, um, I think that's an important tool because, you know, I mean, me personally, in my district, I had um, several tragic fires um, um, over the last uh, three, four years uh, since 2015. So this is an extremely important part of um, when you implement bike lanes to have this conversation with the fire department to make sure it's safe for all. So what I'm hearing here in the testimony, what I'm hearing um, 
the answers to my questions is that not all of these hundreds of miles of bike lane have the stamp of approval from the fire department, and that's very concerning to me, and it should be concerning to everyone. Council Member, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that historically, I don't know. I wasn't here when all of the bike lanes were being approved. I know our early bike lane, protected bike lane uh, design back in 2007 and 2006 was developed with input from FDNY. That was a typical design that we installed throughout the city, um, especially in the early days in Manhattan. Um, so those designs were designed with FDNY. Um, and over time, the conversations and the process has changed. Early on, we were working directly with the borough battalions and the borough chiefs. Then we went to a centralized system through the city planning office, the FDNY planning office. And now we're changing the system again to make sure we're getting more input um, from the local houses. So um, we are very c um, concerned about uh, the FDNY's response and we want to make sure our designs are working for them and as well as bringing safety to uh, all street users. So does every final plan need a stamp of approval from the FDNY, an actual stamp of approval? We ask for FDNY to sign off on our fi final So plan. why wouldn't they? Uh, there's a variety of um, concerns we've heard over time, things that we've been able to work through, um, making sure that they can turn off of side streets if we've narrowed a street, uh, making sure that we provide a clear lane. Most of our protected bike lanes are actually used by FDNY as a clear lane to get around um, traffic congestion. The, the lanes are designed at 11 feet or more. Uh, many of the lanes are designed at 11 feet or more so that uh, the FDNY can actually use that as an extra emergency lane. That was an early uh, factor in our designs um, going back to 2007. So is it possible to provide the council with um, um, uh, all the bike lanes that before you were here, before you came into this job, and up until now of those plans that actually have a stamp of approval from the FDNY? I'm not sure. I, we can look into that. Okay. So, okay. I. Uh, that's it. Thank you. If any customer have one more question, if not, no, Councilmember Lander, you have one question? No, wrong. Uh, are you aware of a child that died in Queens recently coming out from the bus and being hit? Uh, council member, if you're referring to uh, a crash that occurred in April in uh, Rockaway, yes, we're aware of it, and we've we've uh, we've reviewed the, uh, the 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 crash report on that. Okay, and we know that the the NYPD gave a thousand of violation, some for ticket for violation. It, you know, that number per se reflect also right. the other. So how serious is the problem in state and nationwide? Right. I mean, so the, the crash you're referring to was um, a very um, horrible situation where the, uh, the passenger of a, um, a non-DOE, a private uh, school bus, was, was leaving a bus to board a, um, a private van um, that was parked. Um, so no vehicle was actually passing a stopped school bus. The parked vehicle uh, accelerated into the child. Um, uh, you know, from, from the parking lane. Um, it, it was a very, um, you know, again, a, a very horrible uh, situation. I, it, it, it doesn't really um, get back to this issue of the stop arm cameras, um, unfortunately. So it was a, um, you know, I think the, the, uh, the crash report uh, identified it as pedal misapplication. The driver accidentally pressed the wrong pedal um, and accelerated into the child. I is, again, I don't question the great job that you guys as a staff of DOT and the commissioner per se, you know, we know that we were there in our community in Washington Heights last week, you know, putting the billboard on Vision Zero Education Awareness, which was a great initiative. I, I just would like for the agency to leave you so open to continue discussing, you know, both. Uh, all bills. I feel that all bills are very important. You know, we need to, uh, when it comes to protect the 
utility workers. You know, when you, we drive by through the FDR from Dagman to 157, you see the whole street being open. Like, we only get to see the workers above the ground, but we don't know, we don't get to see who are working down there. And I think that, you know, anything that requires to improve the safety of the workers is something that, you know, we have to address it and improve it and, and get it done. It, and when it comes to, again, like, we don't need to wait for a case. And, and we all care. The, you work 24 seven, you know, working around policy and strategy. We want to make the street safer for everyone. I just feel that when we look at the 50,000 a, a number of driver that they keep going through yellow bus and when the stop sign is out throughout the state of New York and knowing that that's an epidemic throughout the whole nation. I just would like for us to continue giving the space to looking at those data, to look at the issue and, you know, continue conversation. Chairman, we hear you loud and clear and we would like to continue the conversation and uh, I mentioned to Council Member Kalos earlier, we would like to get together and review the data um, because he has some data that, um, that we haven't had an opportunity to review yet. So we would like to do that with you. Thank you for supporting, especially the speed camera initiative, but all the work that we do really have gone, gotten a long way together. Do we have a cyclist director at DOT right now? And who is the person, who does that person report to? Yeah, so I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Street Improvement Programs. Um, I oversee the divisions of uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, public space, and street improvement prog projects. Each of those have a director. Ted Wright is the director of our bicycle program. Tara Ishii, who's actually here, is the director of our pedestrian unit. Emily Weidenhoff, the director of our public space unit. How many staff are dedicated to your division? So my division has uh, 14 people in the pedestrian unit, plus uh, eight people in the public space unit, um, 18 people in the bike unit, um, which will be increasing with new hires on the green wave. Um, these are just three units. There's other units in the agency that work on bicycle and pedestrian projects. For example, our school safety division recently installed a protected bike lane on 7th Avenue in Brooklyn. Um, so the, the work is cross unit, but we have these three specific units focused directly on bicycle and pedestrian safety. So what is the total number? If we add those numbers for all those three, what is the total number? Uh, for the three, um, let's see. About, uh, well, my unit altogether is about 45 people, plus the new um, six we're hiring with Green Wave, about over 50 folks, specifically uh, focusing on bicycle and pedestrians. And, and that's um, planners, engineers, outreach specialists, administrators, um, directors, so the runs the gamut. So by the total is around like 100, you can say? Dedicated to pedestrian and cyclists only? Uh, there's somewhere between 50 and 100 planners and in, you know, office staff. Beyond that, we have our engineers that are signing and uh, working on our drawings. We have the uh, divisions that are installing the bike lanes and the signals and all the work that goes into it. Um, Really, throughout the agency, there's probably hundreds, thousands of people focused on getting this uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure installed in the city. Uh, my unit's mainly the planners and outreach, um, but it extends beyond that. And how many, how many staff do we have at DOT as an agency? 5,600. 5,600. So I, I think that you know we need to do our role from the legislative role I know that you need to do your role from the staff. We want to empower the men and women that are designated to cyclists and pedestrians. And we want to increase that number. And we want to see a clear cut. I would like to go to DOT, to Water Street, and be able to go to the two or three floor. It does the area only through a screen, only dedicated, yes, to pedestrians and cyclists. I want to be sure that again that you know, when we want to turn our city as the leading one in the nation, 
on pedestrian and cyclists is because there's, as you know, you have more expertise than I do. And you know that there's a whole national movement about how to do more urban planning and more designing to make our street more pedestrian and cyclists. And, and we have the street or the middle class and upper class in one side, and then we have the other street or the poorest New Yorkers. When I walk to the South Bronx, you know, you walk through that area, it's tough. You know, it's, it's difficult for, you know, it's not only about the bike lane, it's how safe are those communities. When you walk through some parks, like, like 20 peck officers dedicated to go through the street, you know, we just want to centralize. You want to see something that is more, you know, great architecture, great engineer, great team, but this is about, you know, can we leave something for on the, can we build something on the present and future administration that we can say, you know, we are the, we are the city that is the leading one. And, and, and so that, for me, the most important, you know, message about, you know, no question, I don't have any question about your capacity, your commitment, the great job, the great partnership, but this is about, let's be sure that, you know, let's leave our space open and let's continue, you know, discussing uh, to see how far we can go. Of course, I strongly support, as I say, all the bill. The workers, the utility workers had to be protected. You know, they do a great job. We want electricity. We want internet. We want, you know, all those services in our apartment, in our building, in the school, in the public and private sector. And they are the one, you know, who get the job done. And we want the bosses to have the technology. Let's take advantage of where we are today. And, you know, with that, I would like to, to say thank you for being here. Thanks. Now we're closing, calling the next panel. Corey Muirhead, Jean Solieri, Al Russo and Xavier Maynard, William Smith. We're going to be timing on two minutes, so if it will take more than that, please be sure that you're summarized. Perfect. Good. So um, thank you, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee for allowing me to speak today on this important... <laughs> I get to keep going? Okay, good. I got more to say. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank the bill sponsor, Councilman Ben Kalos, um, his leadership on child safety issues will have a lasting impact across all of um, the communities of New York, so I, I want to thank him for that. My name is Jean Soulier. I'm CEO of Bus Patrol. Our technology is the most deployed stop arm enforcement technology in the world. I'm a Vision Zero advocate, specialized in the school bus safety technology that's being discussed today as part of this legislation. I also believe in a data-driven approach. I have lots of data. The data will paint a very compelling picture. The videos we collect are worth a million words, not a thousand. 
More importantly, I stand before you today as a father of five children and a grandfather of two. I'm here to talk to you about the gravity of this situation of people not respecting the school bus sign and illegally passing it. And it's from my perspective as a father that I want to share that. Many of, you, many of you have heard the stats according to the data cited by the governor's office that approximately 50,000 drivers illegally and dangerously pass stop school buses during drop off and pick, off, pick up every day in the state of New York. These stats are, if anything, understated. We have three pilots in New York, East Meadow, um, Half Hollow Hills, and Niagara City. They average between two and four violations per bus per day. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if New York City had 50 violations in one day alone. As shocking as those numbers are, they don't tell the real story, the full story. In Montgomery County, Maryland, we run by far the largest stop arm enforcement program in the world. Their entire fleet, 1,400 buses, is equipped with the latest safe bus technology. We've successfully driven violation rates down by more than 50% since the program started almost three years ago. Despite that fact, I'm saddened to share with you that last week in the span of 12 hours in Montgomery County, two children lost their lives on their journey to and from school. A nine-year-old girl and a 17-year-old boy. Two families irreparably broken. I'm not here to tell you that this might happen in New York. I'm here to tell you that it will. I'm here to tell you that people just don't care enough about school buses. And they don't, they don't pay enough attention to the precious cargo that's carried on them. Not only do we need to update the tools we use to protect our children, but we need to change our culture. I want to create a culture where people are afraid of school buses. I want to create a culture where people pump their brake when they see a school bus in the very same way they do when they see a police cruiser that they cross on the road. I want every single school bus in New York City to have this technology. Not 10%, not 20%, 100. Because the ability to collect vital data is going to help us understand what actions to take. We can be proactive seeing where these violations are occurring and determining what actions we can take, maybe change stops before tragedy strike. We can target social awareness campaigns to communities in a way that help them understand the problem and change the way they think about child safety. We've advocated for the last few years with the state, and now we have a law. The moment is upon us and the power is yours. As a parent, I pray that the residents, for the residents, that you'll take advantage of every tool available to prevent another child's life being lost. And yes, that means every bus for every school for every child should be covered. The safety a child enjoys should never depend on their zip code. And that goes from the bustling streets of downtown Brooklyn and Manhattan to the more residential areas of Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx. No one counts unless we all count. So I implore you to create a program that mandates full fleet coverage. It's the only way to be both inclusive and objective in how you measure the program's success. It's also the only way to prevent ever having to explain to a grieving parent why their caught child's bus didn't have it. Before I leave you, I want to make one final point. These are not accidents. The videos show it. These are really bad choices with very devastating consequences. They're avoidable crashes, and every loss is avoidable. We need drivers to have a healthy fear of breaking the law, and the best way to do that is to have the best technology possible on every bus. We owe nothing less than that for all of our children. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Chairman Rodriguez, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to the Utility Workers Union of America, Local 1-2, New York, AFL-CIO to speak on the proposed legislation to require that employers provide advance notice of schedules to utility safety workers instead of using on-call demand. I am William Smith, Vice President of Local 1-2, and I represent utility workers, primarily working for Con Edison, the men and women who keep the lights on. 
We agree with the sponsor of this legislation, Congressman Brad Lander, that for the safety of all New Yorkers, utility workers need clear, advanced schedules in order to perform street markings for underground infrastructure work with precision. As in the common practice today, the workers who provide street markings for utility work, whether it's internet cable, gas, steam, or water, are on-call contractors who do not know from one day to the next what the work day will be, or if indeed there will be a work day. This bill will prohibit employers from canceling, changing, or adding work shifts within 72 hours of the start of the shift, except in limited circumstances. The bill would also require that employers provide such utility safety workers with a written work schedule no later than 72 hours before the first shift on the work schedule to post the worker's schedule at the work location 72 hours before the beginning of the scheduled hours of work and to provide a written copy of an employee's work schedule for any work, for any week worked within the prior three years. One thing this bill would accomplish would be to prevent employer abuse of on-call workers and provide the utility workers with a steady schedule that would stop employers from exercising capricious and ultimately unfair working conditions. It has been well established that workers who do not have a similar schedule day after day have difficulty remaining alert and careful at their jobs. Given the complexity of underground New York City, having skilled workers well rested because they know their hours ahead of time will allow them to be able to perform the work that is demanded by their employers in a safe manner. Our members who work for Con Edison find out all too often that if there are errors and markouts which would have caused disasters if not caught. The proposed bill would hopefully reduce these errors as well as those times, rare though they may be, when the condescending employees arrive at a site only to find that the markouts have not occurred at all. This bill will make mistakes less likely to occur and provide a safer work environment for all. Whether they are the utility workers marking where the infrastructure is buried and prevented inact Digging or the utility or road workers who depend on the markouts being made by these safety workers or the general public. We have seen time and time again that cutting corners and utility work leads to accidents, explosions, broken water mains, and the list goes on and on. Those who follow the markouts need to know they will not damage electric cables, gas lines, steam lines, water pipes, or television slash internet cables by performing the duties on the city's delicate infrastructure. As we all know, any damage to these underground lines could lead to Mayard problems in repair, maintenance, and installation of underground utilities, and thus disruptions of New York City's family and businesses. In the meantime, it is unfortunate that utilities are not already required to provide clear, advanced work schedules for their employees. Con Edison especially relies on outside contractors to perform such services because it seems to be its basis of operation in the long term not to have skilled workers on its payroll. We suspect that using the on-call system is just another dodge to take advantage of workers' need to work so that they submit to being on-call workers, reducing their incomes, and disrupting their lives. We know on-call is a problem for workers in the service industry in restaurants and retail stores, and it has caused them to organize and fight back to know their schedule ahead of time. After all, that is only fair to these New York workers. It should not be used by utility industry companies just to squeeze extra profit at the expense of the same rationale, common dignity, and respect they should extend to the people who do their work and to the people who live and work in the city, who deserve to be able to live their lives without the fear of incorrect markout could cause a loss of electricity, a burst steam pipe, flooded streets, a loss of their TV or internet cable. Worst of all, another gas explosion, which can destroy homes and places of work, these companies, places of work. These companies have been stopped from placing profits before human beings. Using on-call workers is merely another tactic that holds workers back from building steady lives for themselves because they have to take the job available to put food on the table. By another name, we call it exploitation. Is all, we also call it a danger to the people of the New York City. For the good of all New Yorkers, we strongly support that the city do all it can to eliminate this egregious use 
of people to increase profits by putting all the people who live and work in New York City at risk, because this is exactly what the on-call system does. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee. Thank you very much for convening this important hearing and allowing me the opportunity to testify in support of intro 946 and 947 this afternoon. My name is Al Russo and I'm the Vice President of the Communication Workers of America Local 1101. I've served in this position for the last nine years. I am also a resident of Dyker Heights, Brooklyn. I have lived there for the last 45 years. I am here today both as a New Yorker and in my official capacity on behalf of the 215 utility safety workers that we represent in Local 1101. The workers are employed by the United States Infrastructure Corporation, USIC, who is primarily the contractor for Con Edison and National Grid. These are employees who do underground locating work across New York City and Long Island. These workers perform critical tasks essential to health and safety of all New Yorkers. Underground safety workers identify underground gas, electric, and telecommunication lines in advance of construction to prevent dangerous explosions and the interruption of critical services. In New York City, before a street can be dug up for any reason, whether to repair a water main or add conduit for cable, the company doing the digging must call 811 in order to ensure a ticket and I'm sorry, in order to issue a ticket for underground locators to be sent out to mark the street. This is a vital step in order to ensure that any digging is done safely and protects crucial underground infrastructure. There are, seri there are serious consequences to this work being done incorrectly, everything from a disruption in water service to a full-on deadly gas explosion. This work being done incorrectly is a hazard to the employees on site and to the public at large. That is why it is essential that we pass this legislation. Intro 946 will prohibit on-call scheduling for utility safety workers who locate and mark underground infrastructure. Several times per month, utility safety workers are scheduled to be on-call after a full shift. A typical shift for one of our workers would be 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. They would uh, then be required to be on-call from 5 p.m. until the, uh, to the next shift, the next morning at 7 a.m. It is common to be called in multiple times on call, multiple times on an on-call shift. And regardless of how many times you are called in or how long, you are still required to show up the next morning for the start of your shift. This means that these workers are not getting sufficient rest time. You cannot adequ adequately perform this job. That requires you to be alert and precise on insufficient sleep or broken up sleep. These workers are doing important work that a single mistake could lead to something catastrophic. These workers are often doing this work in busy intersections or on highways with cars zooming past them. One misstep due to exhaustion could lead to a tragedy. To protect these workers, these co -worker, their, co their co-workers and the public at large, we need to ensure that they have sufficient rest. Furthermore, we need to make sure that they are adequately trained to do the job. Intro 947 would ensure that anyone who applies for a permit to open a street certify to the Department of Transportation that all workers covered by the permit are in compliance with relevant safety training, education laws, and regulations in order to protect public safety and health. Currently, our workers receive two weeks of classroom training prior to the test taking. And if they pass the test, they then are paired with one, more, one or more senior people uh, to do a ride along for at least one to two weeks. After one to two weeks of the on-the-job training, these workers are expected to do the job on their own. We've heard from our senior workers that the length of training has been decreased over time, particularly the ride-along portion, which they identify as the most important part of the training. In fact, some workers remember a time where as a new employee, you'd be scheduled for three to six months of riding along before you ride on your own. This means that there are many new utility safety workers responsible for the welfare of critical infrastructure and their own safety put into dangerous situations at, with inadequate training. More senior employees tell us that they see the consequences of this, more accidents and more damage. We need to make sure that the workers performing these critical services to New York City have the protections they need to do their job best to serve the city. I am asking for your support for this vital legislation. Please thank you, please, please, and thank you very much for your time, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee, my name is Xavier Maynard and I am a member of the Communication Workers of America Local 1101 and uh, Underground Utility Locator. I work for the United States Infrastructure Corporation for three years. I live in Bayside, Queens for the past 20 years. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to share my experience and express my support for the intro 946 and 947 this afternoon. These bills are essential in order to protect the public safety and to ensure that workers who provide a vital service to New Yorkers do so safely, properly, and in compliance with all laws. This legislation would have a direct impact on me and people like me who do the job and provide this important service for our city. I take my responsibility of protecting our city's infrastructure and public safety very seriously. We are the people who make sure that our streets are dug up, your neighbors are protected from gas main explosions or electrical or phone outages. We care about the people of and New York City and Long Island. <clears throat> Before any company digs up a street in New York City or Long Island, USIC workers survey the ground and its infrastructure like gas mains, electrical lines, and we mark the streets so that any digging doesn't cause any electrical outages or even worse, gas main explosions. If this work is not performed properly, residents are put in grave danger. USIC workers are sometimes required to be on call 24 hours straight on the weekend and also several times a month from the end of the shift in the evening until the start of the next shift in the morning. That means after working from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., I'm still on call and could be required to go back to work at 2 a.m. to finish a locate around 4 a.m. And then I would still have to show up at 7 a.m. for my regular shift the following day. You are consistently monitoring your work phone to make sure that you don't miss a call. When you receive a call, you have two hours to respond. Then you have to go back home clock in, research the job, jump in the company van and go. If you miss the call or report late, you are dinged. And if you miss more than twice, you are out. You also receive no additional compensation unless you are responding to an emergency. Let alone any concern for our quality of life and ensuring time with our families. Being on call like this makes it impossible to get a decent night's sleep. Without a decent night's sleep, a dangerous job turns into a possible tragedy. When you're on the highway with cars zooming past, trying to read plans and maps, you need to be completely aware and alert. This is why I urge you to pass intro 946. If you don't, <coughs> if, <coughs> excuse me, if I don't do my job right, I could hurt myself, coworkers, or the general public. In addition to making sure rest time is protected, we need to make sure that people performing this work are adequately trained. When I first started working for USIC, I was given two weeks of classroom training before I took a four-hour test. Then I spent about a week or so in a ride-along with a senior technician. These ride-alongs are so important because this is when you really pick up the nuances of the job. Also, there are some real-time situations that can't be covered in classroom training. I do not believe the training is sufficient with locating work, you actually have to be in the field to understand a lot of the work. Every neighborhood is different. In this area, the cable, the cable might be really old and deep, and in other areas, more close to the ground. In order to do the job safely and correctly, you need to learn these things. This, that is why the council should pass intro 947, which would ensure that those performing this work are adequately trained and in compliance with all safety and educational laws and regulations. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to share my experiences as an underground utility locator and expressing my support for the intro of 946 and 947. I'm available for any questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, how have, Mr. William, uh, how have other municipalities uh, addressed similar legislation as the one that we have here? Uh, none that I know of. So it can be that New York City could be the first, one of the large municipalities that? Yes. Okay. And, and which are the private sector beside Cornetison and 
Verizon, right? Which other private sector also do you work for? Do you provide the services? Did, I'm sorry, that I provide the services? No, I say like, like the worker that we have here and those that you represent. So the USIC employees, yeah. um, they, they uh, do locate work for Con Edison, they do uh, utility locate work for um, National Grid, they work for PSE&G, um, what else do they do? That's it. That's it. And Verizon? Uh, Verizon has, that, that stays in house. So okay. we do our own utility locate work uh, inside. I represent Verizon also. So okay. we, we have, uh, all workers do our own utility locate work. So I feel, I believe, right, that Verizon support uh, this legislation with some changes. Have you heard the same thing from Cornelison and others? Um, I can't answer that question, I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilman Lander. Thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Um, so uh, just as you heard, the administration is, I think, open to working with us here, but wants a little more information to just make sure we're really tailoring this. So on the scheduling, so it sounds like you get a regular schedule in advance, so you know which days you're working 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., but then on some of those days, you also could be required to also be on call all night long while still showing up the next day. Do I have, I have that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I mean, and, and then you don't even, you don't get, you, you, you don't, I assume in those on-call situations, even though you're like staying up with your phone on, if you're not called, you don't get paid at all. Is that right? Like you're, you're told you have to be on call, but they're not paying anything for your on-call time, only if they call you in? Uh, yeah, you, if once you're called in, then you'd have to be required to respond. Right, but in those cases where they don't call you, even though you're like sleep is disturbed and you're watching your phone, you don't get anything for having right. given That's your time the to them. That's correct. Um, and and do you just say even then you sometimes get uh, overtime pay and some or, or higher than regular pay and sometimes don't for the hours that you might work in the night? Uh, depending on the amount of time that you've already put in compared to the 40-hour work week, if you would go over the 40 hours, then yeah, you... So that's just, I mean, if you go over 40 hours, you get state over, you know, get overtime pay per state law, but just your on-call shift is not paid any more than a regular shift. Right, that's correct. It's the same amount. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and is is that work is this on call work like emergency work or is it just work that's getting done at nighttime that they're calling you in to do uh that would vary depending on the actual job that needs to get done so sometimes it might be a genuine emergency right and then other times it might be done because it's um it's later in the in the uh in the morning time so it's less traffic got it but they don't have any obligation to so they might be scheduling work at nighttime that they know in advance and then still leaving you on call, calling you in in the middle of the night and paying you nothing extra for it. Right, that's correct. Okay, that doesn't seem right. Um, yeah, I mean, that's why we're here, I understand. But I just, you know, I mean, we're trying to, this isn't unusual. It's a sector a lot of us don't know anything about and I think, you know, trying to understand. So um, do you think that, uh, there was a question asked by um, the C uh, Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, um, one model for this kind of problem is just to ban it, you know, and say, you can't do this practice. Another model is to say, if you're going to do it, there has to be what's called premium pay. You have to pay extra for the kind of shifts scheduled in this way. D do you have a thought on which is the appropriate approach here? I would say definitely premium pay. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so that's good. And we have some models for premium pay in the fast food, you know, in the fast food sector where there's extra that has to be paid for these kind of on-call, these on-call shifts. Um, okay, uh, I think those are my questions on the, on the scheduling. Just on training, um, what you're describing sounds a little bit like more like something that's kind of like an apprenticeship, you know. Um, you, you learn by riding along, you see how it's done, and, and that's what we want. Um, I think uh, for us to, to tailor this law well, it'll be useful to understand it better. Um, you know, is there any kind of, um, well, let me ask you, who's coming, are, are the people that are coming to this work have prior experience in the field or is, it, is this usually the first job 
someone has that's anything like this? Uh, generally, the majority of the time, it's, it's usually the first job that has to do with this particular sector. Okay. And is there any certification at all that you, that you would get? Uh, you are required to pass a four-hour test, which gives you uh, the certification of the Northeast Gas Association. Okay, but that, so that's useful to have, but not nearly sufficient to do the work, it sounds like. Well, it's, it's mandatory that you have that in order to actually get the job, but then there are some real-time situations, as I stated, um, that you would actually learn as you're actually out there, because it's different as far as the classroom compared to the actual real world. Got it. But it's not, I mean, in other sectors where there's, um, you know, unions and, 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 and kind of like a, a more trade union model, there's some standard, you know, you do a certain amount of hours, you learn a certain amount of things, and then you go from apprentice to journeyman. There's nothing like that here. Right, that's correct. Um, personally, I would, I would think that probably a longer period of time, as Al had stated, a uh, longer period of time, actually riding with a senior, partner would probably be more beneficial not only to the company but also to the public safety as well got it um, okay all right I think for, to go deeper and dig into this on what would have to be included what you'd want to you know I think we may have to figure out a little more if we're gonna define that you have to have I mean obviously it, it's both in the benefit of the workers but in this case even more to the benefit of the public the on-call scheduling prohibition has some public benefits so we know you're not exhausted but it's you know largely a worker safety protection the safety training is largely a public safety protection to make sure that the work gets done right so I think I won't ask more questions about it here because we got a lot of people signed up to testify on the other bills, but I think we may want to follow up with you just to really understand what the critical kind of skills and experiences are and, and how it will be possible to be clear, to know, you know, I think the challenge for us will be to pass a law that says the company has to make sure the workers have that and then can certify to the DOT and we can organize it in a way that makes sense with the permit pulling. We're going to have some more work to do to really figure out with you what workers need to know and how you would certify or know that they had gotten that training. Um, so well, can we follow up with you guys afterwards to make sure we really understand this in enough detail to be able to do the legislation appropriately? The communication workers would be more than happy to work with your office to sit down and anything that we could do to help, we would be more than happy to do so. Okay. Yeah, utility workers, local 1 2 also. Great. Thank you very much. No further questions. Councilman Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I had a twin brother. Uh, I have a twin brother, and I had a twin brother uh, who, who was an on call worker. And I remember just the exhaustion and the sleep deprivation. And I remember thinking to myself, you, you cannot live freely and sleep consistently if your work schedule is at the whim of an arbitrary and abusive employer. And he was in retail. And the stakes are even higher when you're managing critical infrastructure. You know, like Brad, I, I don't know much about the industry of utility locators. I first read about it a few years ago because of CWA. But, but at the time, if I remember correctly, the workers were paid minimum wage, $15 an hour, received under in some cases, under sub-minimum wage, uh, the bare minimum of pay time off, right? No safety training, required to be on call 24 seven and then report within two hours of receiving a call. Like we were paying minimum wage or sub-minimum wage to workers whose work is of maximum importance to public safety. But that was a few years ago. What's the state of working conditions today in the industry? So we were able to obtain a contract that had um, a better living wage in there. There were some provisions that were put in there to try and uh, boost some of the, uh, um, it's not really the scheduling, but some of the uh, um, stuff that was in the, con that they didn't have in a contract previous, which was really uh, a detriment, you know. It's very simple. When you have a company like USIC, they have to put paint on the floor in order for them to make any kind of money. So they will send their workers out there. The quicker they get them going on the street is the quicker they're going to get them out there to mark paint on the floor. But that's really not the way to do it. So we did add something with wage in there. Uh, we, uh, we also added something with something with on when you're working overnight that you needed to have at least un un uninterrupted time of rest before you came to work. Uh, and it, I think it was uh, what we, six hours we put in there. 
you had to have six hours of uninterrupted rest. But it's still, look, it's something because they didn't have nothing previous. But uh, look, our workers were very, uh, uh, con uh, they were happier than where they were. So they definitely uh, were very happy that we were there to get certain things added into there, especially with the wage uh, and especially with adding that sleep time that would help them out a little bit. And what's the wage at the moment? Uh, right now we have a wage progression that goes up to 31.50 an hour. And and previously, it starts, at, it starts start when we first got them. I think they were at 11.75 an hour, wow. and uh, some I think at the point we're making up to 23, 24 dollars an hour. Now it ranges from you could start at 17 dollars an hour and range uh, after five years up to 31.50 an hour. Would you say that USIC is still a bad actor? I would say yes. And, and how much responsibility in your mind does? Con Edison and National Grid bear? Bear on? For, for the abysmal working conditions that the utility locators have to face. I don't think, I, I, I don't, it's hard for me to answer. I don't know. I don't know that answer. You said Verizon has in-house. In-house. Utility locators. Yes. Whereas Con Edison and National Grid contract out. Correct. Should, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, should, should Con Ed and National Grid have their own in-house workforce? Like what's the right approach? Or? I don't know if it's that's the answer. I think if we could just, you know, uh, the same standards, each of those, uh, Con Edison and National Grid, just like Verizon, they have unionized workforce, they're held to some safety standard. I think if USIC was held to that same safety standard or any locating service that's out there, they're held to the same standards that all of our, you know, industries that we represent are, I think they would probably be a, a, a value to have for the USIC workers. So as far as keeping it in-house, I don't, I don't have an answer either way. I don't. I, I read a few years ago that uh, a company connected to the DeVos family was intent on acquiring USIC. Did that acquisition ever take place? W whatever became of that? It's owned by a hedge fund company. There are various, you know, things that are involved with it. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that okay. question either. But we, d we don't know whether there are any financial ties between members of the Trump administration and USIC. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't know that answer. And I think based on the testimony of, it seems like DOT is open to considering um, safety standards as a condition of granting a permit, but I think DOT feels like it lacks the ability to evaluate whether uh, USIC or a contractor like USIC has sufficient safety protocols. Is there a third party that could certify whether I I'm willing to, to delve into it and help out, you know, yeah. the council any way that I can, and I will, Communication Workers of America will also be willing to help out. I don't know. But as far as you know, there are no national standards for utility locators. The only thing I know is with the workers, they do have to, the, he mentioned something about uh, gas certification. Con Ed also has a certification that they have to do also. So uh, I, that's the only thing that I know. As far as it's a national, I, I don't know that answer. Got it. Well, you, you can count on my support 100%. This to me is a no-brainer. Uh, some of the issues that come before the city council are complicated. This is not one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't ask any question because we addressed Jim a lot of questions on the on the buses, uh, but uh, you know we will, as you heard, we will. This is going to be important for us. Uh, probably, if you, I think I think that what we need to do is to continue. You know, having you your expertise and whoever you feel, you also. We will sit with DOT and DOE, who even though they're not included, because this is basically DOT who were asked to come, but I know the DOE is sitting back there and listening. I know how important it is. At the end of the day, if we move on on this policy, it's gonna be DOE who will be responsible. So hopefully we can have this conversation. And I'm happy again that, you know, we are starting uh, having this hearing today and having not only at the local uh, level, but the national also level, and knowing that, you know, what we do in New York City, we always do it with the intention that it serve a national policy. So we are, you know, we will continue working with you guys. So thank you. Now we're calling the next panel. John Orcutt, Erwin Figueroa, Eric McClure, Christine Berthe, Eric Sundi.
And if there's anyone sitting back there from Cornet uh, or Verizon or anyone, please, I hope that you are taking note. And, and if not, if you follow in this hearing through the website, be sure that, you know, that we follow conversation because it's going to be important for us. Hello, how are you? My name is Christine Berthe from CheckPads. Uh, CheckPads is the New York nonprofit focused only on pedestrians. Our 1,500 members are grateful to Chair Rodriguez and to City Council Rivera. We applaud the creation of an Office of Pedestrian and an ID whose time has definitely come. We respectfully submit the following vital suggestion. The New York City Department of Transportation controls the entire cycling infrastructure, while the walking infrastructure sidewalks is controlled by seven different agencies and a vast number of property owners. Because of this, uh, this office for pedestrians should be a standalone office rather than inside another agency or another office. The office for pedestrian must be independent from the office of cyclists. It must not be subsumed in another office driven by divergent priority. The population served by the two offices have little overlap. Eight million pedestrians are also public transit riders, children, seniors, and disabled people, while the city 1 million or 1.6 million cyclists are predominantly adult male and uh, some females. What these populations have, uh, our vulnerable users have in common is the fact that they are both victims of traffic violence. In just one year, 2019, 136 pedestrians have been killed, a shocking number, often at intersection, and 27 cyclists have been killed, often mid-block. That both groups are being slaughtered doesn't mean that the remedies are the same. And finally, the law should clarify what are the powers invested in this office and what is in its budget. All New Yorkers, thank you for keeping their safety front and center, pedestrian need, must rem remain the highest priority and not be some in another office driven by divergent priorities. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. My name is Eric McClure. I'm the Executive Director of Streets PAC. There are a few transgressions a driver can commit behind the wheel of an automobile that are more egregious than passing a stop school bus, picking up or discharging children. And for that reason alone, we support Intro 1724, which would create a demonstration program to install stop arm cameras on school buses. The danger of such driver action is underscored by the severity of the penalties for doing so. A $250 fine, five license points, and the possibility of 30 days in jail. The act of passing a stop school bus is born either from impatient, callous indifference to the dangers it imposes on others, or a degree of distraction so great that one fails to notice a big bright yellow school bus deploying flashing lights and a large red stop sign. Neither is remotely acceptable, yet according to some reports, it occurs up to 50,000 times per day in the state of New York. Fortunately, given the penalties, the rate of recidivism is low, as low as, five to, as two to six percent per statistics. But enforcement is also nearly non-existent. Under current laws, a police officer must witness the infraction in order to issue a ticket. Stop arm cameras have tremendous potential to improve enforcement in the same way that school zone speed cameras have begun holding dangerous drivers accountable. While we urge the council to pass intro 1724, we also believe it's imperative that the council make certain that the Department of Transportation is provided with the necessary resources for administering a school bus stop arm program. The millions of violations caught by existing speed and red light cameras all require review, and staffing and operating those positions is a tremendous challenge that will only grow with the addition of stop arm violations. The burden for managing that can't just be dropped legislatively on NYC DOT without adequate funding, and we urge the council to make sure those resources are provided. We also support intros 1812 and 1813, which would establish an Office of Active Transportation and an Office of Pedestrians, respectively. While there is some merit to the idea that these offices should be combined, the important thing is to establish these oversight positions, which would coordinate among different agencies to advance the causes of New Yorkers who get around on bike and on foot. Bike mayors in cities like Amsterdam, London, and Sydney have helped those cities greatly increase cycling trips. Placing the offices in City Hall is critical for ensuring that bike and pedestrian initiatives operate across and involve the multiple agencies necessary for successful implementation. 
The Office of Active Transportation and Pedestrians would have critical roles to play in improving the safety of our streets, advocating for the needs of cyclists and pedestrians, and ensuring that the city employs best practices in executing infrastructure projects. Such positions have borne fruit in a number of places around the world, and it's not an idea that's ripe for New York City. Let's pass these bills without delay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Orcutt with Bike New York, testifying in favor of Intro 1812. Um, we won't have a bike-friendly New York if only one part of one city agency is working toward that goal. Um, you know, today we don't really have a consensus within city government um, to make the streets bike-friendly. Uh, while DOT works on bike lanes, um, you know, we have all kinds of um, police activity with uh, police parking in bike lanes, um, sort of misdirected enforcement by the police, very sort of odd behavior with reporting crashes to the media um, by the police. And, you know, we think somebody really looking into how those practices work elsewhere and making suggestions within city government could be a big help. Um, we have vehicle designs that don't lend themselves to a comprehensive bike network. Our street sweepers are too big to allow uh, protected bike lanes that are narrower than the ones we have today. Some of our fire trucks are so big that they, you know, they affect intersection design. Uh, and we'd like, you know, we'd like to see those practices um, really reviewed and researched and, and called into question by a, a different city agency. Um, even some parts of DOT could use some push. Um, you know, city installation of bike racks on the curbsides is way down now from just a few years ago. And um, the city still has yet to come up with a good protocol for when one part of DOT resurfaces streets and pulls all the um, pieces of protected bike lanes off of those streets. Uh, every every spring and summer during peak bike use season, um, so we think a bike mayor can really, um, or ag you know, Office of Active Transportation can really call attention to these issues uh, in a way that you're not going to get, um, you know, sort of a public airing of uh, from within DOT or from within closed door conversations between city agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, my name is Herman Figueroa. I'm the senior organizer of Transportation Alternatives. Uh, TA, Transportation Alternatives, strongly supports intro 1812 and 1813, which will establish offices of active transportation and pedestrians to improve safety and interagency coordination, and we support intro 1724 as well. Uh, for support for intro 1812 and 1813, there's no better time to appoint these offices. Uh, in New York City, a protective bike lane network is not growing fast enough to keep up with demand. More people are on two wheels now with the expansion of city bike and uh, uh, the upcoming legalization of e-bikes and e-scooters. As we approach the end of 2019, we're facing a crisis with at least 28 cyclists killed on city streets, nearly three times the number killed in 2018, and pedestrian fatalities are also on pace to exceed last year. New York is well positioned to be the first mayor U.S. city to appoint a bike mayor. It was the first in the nation to adopt Vision Zero, has the largest bike share system, and if the 1.6 million New Yorkers who ride a bike once a month, it will make it, uh, it were to, be, to establish a city of their own, it would be the fifth most populous in the country. So the key potential benefits of establishing these new offices will be maximizing safety for cyclists and pedestrians, it will ensure equity in bike and pedestrian infrastructure policy, we will have a working cyclist champion, advancing sustainability, advancing youth engagement, promoting bike tourism in New York City, and promoting pro-biking business policies. And for support for Intro 1724, Transportation Alternative supports this legislation, which would allow the city to test automated cameras to enforce against drivers of multi-ton motor vehicles, passing school children as they bore or disembark the school buses throughout the city. Automated enforcement technology provides a highly effective solution to address the challenges and limitations of traditional traffic enforcement. And we support this legislation to provide the city of New York another promising traffic enforcement tool to address the epidemic of reckless driving and traffic violence. And we believe a school bus stop arm camera enforcement program will contribute to a calming effect on driving throughout the city. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. Thank you so much for your leadership and your work on the bill uh, to 1812 and 1813. My name is Eric Zundi and I am a pedicab driver and organizer of pedicab, the pedicab industry. And I'm also a founder of the New York Pedicab Alliance. I'm here to, on behalf of the pedicab industry and the pedicab 
um, Alliance to express support for the creation of a Department of uh, Active Transportation and also uh, pedestrians. For so long, public policies have not worked for the hardworking pedicab uh, drivers in New York City. As working cyclists, we have been denied electric assist legislation uh, that, would have, that would help improve our work and reduce the stigma we experience. However, big corporations are allowed to operate electric bike shares and electric cargo bikes uh, in New York City. We want a bike mayor who will help improve the pedicab experience and pedicab drivers need a space to thrive as a normal mode of transportation uh, in New York City, not just for um, tourists. Except in Central Park where there are five locations where pedicabs are allowed to drop off or pick up. Pedicab drivers can be ticketed for stopping to use the restroom from McDonald's or Starbucks, although pedicabs are allowed to operate anywhere in the city. Pedicabs, pedic the pedicab fare as well is regulated in a way that leaves every driver to set his own price. This situation opens the door to any unscru unscrupulous pedic uh, pedicab driver to hide the rate and only show it at the end of rides. And countless tourists are victim of overcharge and feel ripped off. We want a bike mayor who understands the realities of pedicab, the pedicab workers and who can help um, make pedicab a normal mode of transportation in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. So, and uh, I'm not going to be, again, asking any question because we are partner in this effort in all those areas that you represent. And we are just going to be continue working together. Uh, I'm going to be just adding, you know, that as we are looking to be the more cyclist-friendly city, uh, we also have to start working to be sure that back in New York, get additional two hours for the bike tour so that we can be able to make the bike tour the biggest one in the whole world. We already have the biggest one here with the hours that we have, and, and we know that, uh, of course, DOT Commission has been one of those, you know, big supporter in riding the bike too, and we've been there together, but those are the type of things that we want to look at when we say the more pedestrian and cycling friendly, like adding two more hours for the bike tour, it will make the bike tour that we do in the in here in the nation the largest one in the world, and and we can go to the South Bronx, you know, we can go through the 181st Bridge and and go to you know not only expand the area and yes, imagine the instead of going touching a little bit in the Bronx, be able to go to the South Bronx and cross through 181st. You know, Yeshiva University, Washington, and come back here. You know, it will help the tourism. It will help, you know, the visitors to be exposed and see other areas. So, it, and as I say, with the pedestrian part, remember when we hold a hearing on the Disney custom that we limit to a particular area, I say I support it, but I want to see the Disney community not only being a part in the Times Square Plaza, but also other resources to expand cultural activities in those underserved community. So I, I feel that again, that it, I hope that then with DOT, you know, uh, be able to lead themselves open. And I know that, you know, he expressed not only what the, the team uh, feel, but also the commissioner and hopefully also city hall across. And, and with you, all of you, we're gonna be just keep organizing. I think this is, I hopefully this is going to be another mark that this administration, this mayor can leave for the future generation to create, again, the pedestrian and cyclist uh, department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Ming Sai.
Good afternoon, uh, members of the uh, committee, on, committee on Transportation and Chair Rodriguez. Before I start, please allow me to greatly appreciate the committee for opening the floor to my organization to represent the New York City students of disability. Also, thank you, Chairman Rodriguez, Chairman uh, Mark Traeger of Committee on Education for co-sponsoring, and Council Member Kalos for sponsoring Intro 1724, Stop Arms Cameras on School Bus Transportation. My name is Amy Ming Tsai. I'm a council member for Citywide Council for District 75. I'm also the chair of the Committee on Busing and Safety on my council. I'm also a mom of five children living in Community School District 10 in the Bronx. Today, I speak on behalf of my 26,000 District 75 constituents and their families. Um, approximately 90% of our students in the district ride school buses every day. We're in all five boroughs, over 380 buildings in the New York City, New York City private areas. Um, <clears throat> although we may be a small entity of the 150,000 students that ride buses every single day, but we consider the majority of our students on these buses every single day other than the 10 months in the school year. Um, our students ride throughout the summer as well. Um, our students ride from 6 o'clock in the morning all the way to 8 o'clock, borough to borough, across town. Um, and and just not just general education that travel on field trips and district events, but we as well, too. District 75 students and parents also, requ also request a high demand for bus services for after-school programs. Safety for our students in school, on the buses, off the buses, and in the buses are our highest priority. Of all the fact that we may not be aware of the issues that go along with services, short, shortage, shortages of services and school staff, but safety around our children are very important. And I've actually encountered many of these issues with, bus, uh, with cars, drivers being passed through the stop signs that are on the buses. So having these cameras on our buses will uh, keep all of our communities and our students and the students on these buses safe. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, thank you. And with that, we are getting ready to close this hearing, inviting everyone to please join us at the next hearing that we have this coming Wednesday at 1 p.m., a joint hearing together with the Committee of Aging mental health and our community transportation on assessor right. So with that, this hearing is adjourned.